this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamed live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Mr. Holm. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Ms. Mead. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Motion carries. Thank you. I ask the city manager, Steve Rosenberg, note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, we, uh, we have quite a number of individuals participating yeah. this evening on the Zoom platform. Uh, Clerk of Council, Faith Simmons, Council members, Carolyn Dole and Brenda Mead, Walt Ovenshane, the chair of the Gypsy Hill Golf Course Ad Hoc Citizen Advisory Committee and other members of that committee, including potentially Jesse Bartley, Doris Scott, Wanda Stevens, David Tibbs, Adam Gutterman, Mason Wyatt, and Robert Mortensen. City staff members, Chris Tuttle, James Corbett, and Wes Allred. Uh, and Sheriff Matt Robertson. We have some other individuals, but they will be participating only uh, during the regular meeting and I'll share their names at that time. All right, well, welcome everybody. <clears throat> Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in city hall, Access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During this work session, as in the past, there will be no opportunity for public comment. Public comment will be received during council's regular meeting, which will begin at 7.30 p.m. Instructions for public comment by telephone can be found on agenda for the regular meeting and on council's website at www ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city dash council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation by certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the city council code 2020-04 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04 as extended by City Council Ordinance number 2021-04. All right. And with that said, I would like to um, remind everybody when you come into the chambers or anywhere in City Hall to please wear your mask, uh, practice social distancing, we do offer uh, hand sanitizer at the entrance um, of the um, city council chambers. And we also have disinfective wipes at the podium if you would like to use um, the wipes before speaking. And with that, that takes us on to item number one, consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. I'll entertain a motion to approve the work session and regular meeting agendas. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the work session agenda and the regular meeting agenda with the following changes. Uh, as to the work session, there will be none. As to the regular session, uh, the deletion of item E, discussion and consideration of an uncodified emergency ordinance regarding additional conditions for use of electronic communications in meetings of city public bodies. Vice Mayor, do you want to delete that or do you want to table it? I want to, well, we can take table. Okay. I'm sorry, when table we, that to a, a net the further meeting. I was under the impression that it, it ran out if we didn't approve it tonight. So 
doesn't? No, no. No. We've already approved the um, continuity of government. It's um, um, a couple of amendments to be the extension examined. extension goes through April 8th? April 8th. April yes. 9th. April 9th. April yes. 9th. Yes. Madam Mayor, if I, if I may. Yeah. Uh, uh, Go ahead. I think that if the intention is for item E to be on the meeting agenda for the first meeting in February, that I would respectfully suggest to the vice mayor that his motion be to approve both agendas yeah. as they're presented. And then when council arrives at item at that E, item. Uh, we can do that. Okay, and then, make a motion absolutely. to the table and, and take a vote on the motion to the table. All right. So I, when we come to that item, if you can table it at that time. Perfect. Okay. So do you want to amend I'll your be glad yes, to read it. I move to approve the work session agenda and the regular meeting as presented. Uh, as presented. Yes. All right. So we have a motion on the floor um, by Vice Mayor Robertson. Is there a second? A second. Ms. Terry Holmes. Council Member Holmes seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, so the next item is item number two, a presentation of report and recommendations of Gypsy Hill Golf Course Ad Hoc Citizen Advisory Committee. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. From the outset, let me note for council members that you will notice that we only have two items on the work session agenda this evening. Uh, this item concerning the golf course and a uh, second item concerning the expansion of the Middle River Regional Jail, the proposed expansion. And this was intentional to afford an opportunity for uh, the considerable discussion that we anticipate on those subjects. So I would note for you that, that we have a full 45 minutes to deal with the golf course subject. And right. uh, so, so please keep that in mind. And then you'll have a break and then move on to um, the, the jail matter. This is um, the city council. I'm yeah. on that again every time. So they wanted us to zoom in. This is Councilwoman Mead. I wonder if we could ask whoever is unmuted to please mute. I think they've done so, Ms. Mead, thank you. Um, council will recall uh, last fall uh, directing me to establish an ad hoc citizen advisory committee uh, to provide recommendations to the city for the improvement of Gypsy Hill Golf Course. I made appointments to the committee uh, in the middle of September of last year and appointed 10 individuals to serve on that committee. One of those individuals declined the appointment. One other individual participated, I believe for most of the time that the committee uh, did its work and recently resigned. Uh, so this evening you have in your agenda package, the report and recommendations of the committee we have on the Zoom platform, Walt Obenshain, the chair of the committee, as well as some of the other members of the committee. And I now invite Mr. Obenshain to present the committee's report and recommendations to council. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor and uh, members of council, thank you for this opportunity to come before you on behalf of the Gypsy Hill Golf Course Ad Hoc Committee, duly appointed by and for the city manager and who has since shared the group's report and recommendations with council concerning the ongoing operation of the golf course. We trust you found the report straightforward and clear in our mission to form ideas and programs that should serve to reestablish this recreational amenity as a place where all generations of citizens can participate on a more consistent basis and where financial viability is restored and increased. A few highlights from the report. The original nine holes is already more than 100 years old and several of the original holes were kept in play after the additional nine holes were added in 1968. Stanton has been recognized in a number of major magazines and not only for the beauty of its saved architecture, but also for its arts and park offerings. 
The golf course is certainly a part of that history and as such deserves to be in operation for at least another 100 years, if at all possible. The game is a multi-generational pastime that appeals to the very young as well as the very old. Precious few sports can make that claim. The majority of golfers in this area learned how to play at Gypsy under those that came before them, as do the young players today. As a community, we have reaped the benefit of the character and life values instilled in those who play and have played there. That list would include tradesmen, factory workers, doctors, lawyers, business owners, high school and college players, civic club members, teachers, coaches, golf pros, school board members, city managers, and even mayors and city council members. These people and many, many others have contributed to the fabric of our great city in a multitude of ways that make us successful and proud. This all began on a public, not a private or exclusive golf course. What is most needed at this time are operable golf carts. The average age of the fleet totals 20 years, some older, some not as old. Carts are usually turned in at most courses in at between four and eight years. So two things are obvious. Our carts are long past due and being replaced. And the ones we have between 30 and 34, depending on the day, have served the taxpayers well. A very skilled city mechanic has been the only thing between keeping most of the carts operable and not having any at all. There used to be some 60 carts in operation. However, that number dwindled as play decreased and carts were not replaced. Now we find ourselves in a dilemma. The number of golfers has increased significantly and there are fewer carts to rent. If people leave, the city then loses that potential revenue source. Now, this committee has recommended the purchase of 55 new carts at a cost of $4,400 each, totaling $242,000. We are expecting and hoping to sell the used 34 carts for $1,000 each, totaling $34,000. If the newly proposed member rate of $300 is approved and we are able to sell at least 100 new memberships with many people saying more than that we could get, then that would add another 30,000 toward the cost. There is, as you've noted, a $30,000 budgetary item considered to bring an outside group in to study the course. If that is eliminated, then that would save another considerable amount. Cart fees are also proposed to increase from $13 to $15. Green fees are also proposed to increase by $5. Carts generally cost $1.25 to operate for 18 holes. So each time one is rented, the city earns $13.75 for a single rider or $28.75 when two golfers ride together, which is most often the case. A cart can use the go between two and a half and three rounds before having to be refueled. If the projected membership numbers are reached, then more carts would definitely be needed. Even though walking is the preferred way to play, it is a fact that more people ride. There are many good reasons to have carts, which include the age of the golfer, their health or possible disability, hot weather, topography, lack of caddies, and then tournaments where you may have up to 100 players on the course at once, or maybe that's just their plain preference to ride. Once the staff is able to get the myriad of recommended programs up and running, the course will once again be buzzing with people of all ages and abilities. Youth programs will be subsidized or free and equipment that has been donated will be given free of charge to those needing that service. There is plenty of equipment available. Several council members have asked for data that will, in the future, capture immediately facts and figures for regular review and recommendations once a new point of sale computer program is installed. Currently, most of that is collected by pen and paper. This course uses the fewest maintenance personnel of any layout in the area. They do a masterful job as evidenced by the comments of the golfers who say the fairways and greens are in the best condition ever. Work, however, continues in those areas that have been somewhat neglected, but urgently needed for improved playability and overall appeal. Phases two and three are comprised of the many ideas and suggestions that may come to fruition at later dates 
as the hoped for revenue increases and expenses decrease. Now the committee is very confident that with the determination of the staff, the historic Zipsy Hill course can return to its former glory and in the process become a much less financial burden to the recreation department and the taxpayers in the city. The course absolutely needs to remain open, absolutely needs new members, absolutely needs a fleet of new carts, and finally, absolutely needs council's trust and financial backing in order to go forward. We are hoping for and anticipating a 7-0 vote when that day arrives. Thanks. Questions, folks? All right. Are there any questions by council members? Well, did you say how, this is Terry Holmes. Did you say yes. how the point of sale system would cost? Yeah. What it would cost? Uh, about $1,800, 1200 to 1800 There are different ones that allow you to pick up different things, but we would probably like one in the middle, which would be right around $1,800. That point of sale system would pick up everything when people call in to get their tea times, what carts we're using, who's driving them, where they're coming from, in other words, where they live, uh, these type of things. The weather that day, uh, keep in the cart number to keep carts in general rotation so you don't wear them out. It does all of that. Yes. Are this there is council member Mead. I have some questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Walt. And I want to thank the committee uh, for the work that they've done to develop this uh, strategy. Um, I received information from staff uh, on cart maintenance and rental expense that shows that annual maintenance has ranged from, and this is just cart maintenance, from a high of 3,600 in the year 2020 to a low of $500 in the year 2019. And that cart rentals, uh, in order to provide rental, a, fl a fleet for tournaments and that sort of thing, over a, let's see, 2016, 17, 18, and 19, total $5,000. It, it does seem to me that, that we're not investing a lot in maintaining this fleet as old as it is. And that, uh, and that there, there will be a possibility of just continuing to provide maintenance and perhaps rather than buy 55 new golf carts, phase in new golf carts over a period of time. And I've put together a spreadsheet that I provided to the um, director of finance, uh, Mr. Treyer, uh, that proves essentially that if you buy five new golf carts a year for five years, you reduce the average age of the fleet from 20 years old to down to five years old. Just seems uh, that, that that might be a, a more prudent uh, approach given that uh, the, the, the goals of the, um, of the committee are, uh, are ambitious and, uh, and have never been achieved before, uh, at least not in you know, five or six or seven years. So uh, I wonder if that's a, a consideration. It, it is a consideration and I'm gonna let James Corbett, the supervisor of recreation address the cart issue. But one thing I will say is we have got a, a different mishmash of carts. We cannibalize carts to keep other carts going. And so what you're seeing is carts that are just being used for parts. So that's why you're seeing those numbers lower than they are. So it's hard to keep the, the whole fleet going when you can't cannibalize parts one for the other, for the other, for the other. Uh, James, you wanna go ahead and answer some more about the cart situation. Sure, Madam Mayor and members of council, thanks for having us here today, I appreciate it. I, I, we did take in consideration, we looked over the figures that Ms. Mead submitted and, and typically if the cart fleet was towards a normal cycle, that, I think that would be a great plan, a great idea. Uh, the neglect that has been given as far as uh, rotating the cart fleet around properly has definitely caught up with the golf course and just caused the revenue numbers to constantly just decline. And it basically comes in to a matter of we need a full fleet of carts in order to reach expectations. I think the reason why the revenue numbers are so disappointing is because the hands have been tied uh, by the golf course in regards to uh, the quality of cart it's providing, the number of carts that are available. Uh, if we have 55 or 60 carts that avail are available, you can easily flip those twice in a day. 
on a busy day and do 120 rounds in a day uh, with 33 carts, you can do the math. If all of them are up and running 33, the max we can do is 66 rounds in a day. Um, uh, with my experience, with Wes's experience working in the golf industry on very busy days, doing 120 rounds is, is easy. That's not even difficult. And also too, it makes the course more attractive uh, for tournaments. Um, tournaments such as the Lehigh Boosters Club or Stanton High School Boosters Club, Riverheads Boosters Club golf tournaments, they draw 100 folks to play in that. So you need 50 carts in order to accommodate. Stanton High School still held their tournament at Gypsy Hill at, basically out of a courtesy and tradition uh, but we had to go with a limited number of people to sign up, wasn't able, you know, so that affects their fundraising capabilities. I'm also the coach of Stanton High School, so I'm very familiar uh, with that. And it's, it just has a very negative impact on the golf course. And also, one of the things that Walt touched upon is the rotation of the cart fleet. So if you have 40 or 50 new carts, you can, you can rotate them where they're not aged so quickly. And you can kind of, you know, on the days you only put out 20 carts, you can kind of rotate around the fleet, give some carts a couple of days off. And it provides a really good maintenance plan for our maintenance man. He can keep in stock because you're all going to be the same brand. You can keep in stock filters and tires and, and um, you know, starters and things like that are related to that particular brand. Plus, new carts are going to be under warranty for four years. That's going to cover any, any major problems that you have in regards to steering or anything like that. And the cost average um, is really cheaper, believe it or not, to do a new cart. Say, for example, if we spend $4,400 on a new cart and you guys decide five years from now, this is a terrible idea, we shouldn't have done it, we can easily get between $3,000 and $3,500 for that used cart. That is actual data based on what those type of carts are bringing. So the cost to the city is going to be somewhere between $900 and $1,400 for those five years they had that cart which basically boils down to $180 to $280 a year expense. So with the increase in the cart fee, we really only have to put out each cart to be a revenue generator for the city. We only have to put out each cart 10 times a year with two people riding in it in order just to reach the break-even point. So you need, we need to think of progressively and have a business plan for the golf course to let it succeed. A business plan that includes a quality product, a promise that we're reaching out to the public that we're going to start making things better at Gypsy Hill and do the right thing, offer them a quality product at a quality price. We have all kinds of different entry points where every single person can play at Gypsy Hill, no matter what class of person you are. We want to be attractive to everyone. We have some junior program ideas, some programs for ladies. We, we're really thinking ahead and we want to be revenue generators for the city, not a burden on the city. And this will allow us uh, to accomplish that. Uh, a, uni a unified joint cart fleet has so many advantages as, as opposed to now, I think I figured out we have eight or nine different models out there right now, which makes it impossible for us to carry any stock on any cart. So as Walt um, referred to, we're basically taking from old broken down carts that we have now to service the, the carts that are still running to keep them going because some of the parts are so hard to find or they're so expensive. And you know some of those costs and maintenance, the reason why we haven't had to purchase a new motor because we've taken one off of one that's been wrecked or frame has been bent out that we've had off of a used cart and we're just dwindling down our inventory to a point where it's, it's in a critical stage. All right. This is Carol Dahl. Carol Dahl. Yes, I had a couple questions too. How many uh, carts are currently running versus these ones that have been cannibalized? Uh, Wes, would you like to answer that for Ms. Dull? How many are running? Sure. Um, I had five carts go down last Sunday. So my fleet, uh, when, if everything is up and running, I have uh, 33 carts total. So um, that, that's total with everything running. And six or seven of those won't go up two of our hills at Gypsy Hill. So our customers have to get out and actually push them up the hill. I try to reserve those for our, some of our members who know the op, who know what's going on, who don't don't mind doing that. So, uh, but that's just not a just not a good thing. So thirty, if we have everything up and running. It's thirty three carts, Ms. Dahl. So how many carts are sitting there uh, because they're just parts? Parts have been taken from them and they're just sitting there. 
I have I have two of those carts up in the uh, cart shed right now, and I'm not sure what Randy has down there. I think he has a. It, it's at least two more down in the maintenance department, so it's at least four of them. And basically, the two that I have up in the cart shed right now are totally cannibalized. Okay, and then if if you're saying that you're going to sell these old ones for a thousand dollars, why would anybody buy them if they're not if they're so crappy? James, well, you know that one. Sure, I'll be I'll be happy to answer that. That is a that's an excellent point, and uh, and just based on past history is, is the information. And I could say that that actually Walt gave you guys a low number. I think the the ones we've sold recently have been somewhere between the thirteen and sixteen hundred dollar range, and trust me, they are total garbage. But on, when you put them on gov deals, as the price they bring, people I think like taking them on, taking them on as personal projects, use them as like fun vehicles, RV vehicles they use for hunting or use at Smith Mountain Lake, things like that. We've had people come in as far, I know, as from Tennessee, Alabama, who buy them on gov deals, come in with trailers, pick them up and take them away. That is just the market for those carts. It's, it, it is quite unbelievable. So, so they're still usable. They're not really crafted. That well, they take them, they, they redo them. They put new engines in them, lift kits on them, repaint them, things like that. And they resell them for six, $7,000 if they don't use them themselves. Okay, then my, my next question is if, since we don't have any good data on usage uh, at this time, but the, the promise with this point of sale system that you want will be that we'll get data on everything. Now, I'm assuming that means that we can actually get data that shows us how many unduplicated Stanton residents are, are using the golf course. Not the rounds, but the actual people and unduplicated. So assuming that that's doable, why don't we lease the carts for the next year while we're accumulating accurate data? And then we can tell better, you know, what, what we need to do and what we don't need to do. Got that, James? We, we've discussed that too, Carol. Yeah, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can about this, Carolyn. That's a very good question. And, and, and the question it boils down to is that we did our due diligence as far as what would be the best, uh, the best result for the city. And so comparing everything, so basically let me give you a breakdown of a cart lease. So a typical cart lease is five years. Uh, I'll give you the exact numbers on based on the exact cart that we got quoted for $4,400 to purchase. You can, you can break those leases, I think, after three years with no penalty, which basically you paid every monthly payment. And for us, it's $50 a month based on the cart. So if we, if we kept the cart that we decided to lease and say we leased it out for the entire five years, it would cost the city $3,028 to lease that cart. But at the end of the five years, we don't have a cart. We turn it back in. We don't own anything. So we've basically spent $3,000 this five years. So basically the cost to us has been over $600 a year to have that cart. Um, the earliest you can break it, there's, they don't do anything as far as a one year or two year lease. The minimum you could do, you'd have to agree to a five year lease and then break it after three years at a minimum. Um, where I gave the example before, if you purchase a cart for $4,400 and you decided you absolutely hated this, this is not working, we can resell that cart and the most you're out maximum is $250 a year. Um, and the cart, based on revenue, that the cart will easily pay for itself many, many times over, uh, well, even, even, the, even if you had a terrible year. The golf course is never going to make money, not ever, ever, ever. And we're not looking for that. But if what I am looking for is usage by Stanton residents because it's their money that's paying for it. And, and we've never been able to get that data. I, I think... From the little bit I could see, we had uh, more non-Stanton residents playing it than Stanton, uh, but it can't be verified for sure. I heard the same um, advocacy uh, when I first came on city council that if only we would spend six hundred thousand on an irrigation system, we would just people would be flocking to that golf course but it was just that the greens were too dry and nobody could play on them. And it was gonna be great if we'd just do that. So we, bought, we went in 
and added that to a bond issuance. And we are still paying on that 600,000. However, it did not improve the usage at all. And so, you know, I feel justified in being worried about this time because it's this, I'm hearing the same arguments and, and it worries me to put anything significant into an investment without knowing actually what the result will bring. Uh, and that's why I cannot believe that you cannot lease carts for anything less than five years. So, you know, I don't know how many places you've looked, but that seems odd. I have 25 years in the business in regards to being around golf. And I used to be a director of golf, used to be a head pro myself. Wes is also a head pro. We've, we've done extensive work in regards to this project. And I, I'm just, I'm giving you the data straightforward. Well, except we don't have the data on usage. We, we just don't have it. Well, Carolyn, let me just say, I, I got, we got something from um, Bill Trailer, who outlined where everybody was coming from. I'm not sure what the particular time, but as for a number of rounds of 9,067, 4,635 were Stanton, 4,432 were other. So it was by, even by his measure, 2% more Stantonians. However, we're not charging county people to use the tennis courts, the basketball courts, the other recreational programs, the swimming pool, uh, where they're coming from doesn't figure in to what they're paying or what they're using. None of them are, are spending, it doesn't cost as much to operate two swimming pools as it does the golf course. So it's kind of different that way. So when, when you lease carts, who maintains them? You can buy you can buy for additional fee. You can pay a total maintenance free fee to the to the company you're leasing from, or you can decide to maintain them yourself. Uh, so there's different options in regards to that. The price I gave you was with the um, it comes with the normal warranty that comes with the cart, the four year warranty that covers anything major. Um, doesn't it doesn't cover routine maintenance, but that's with the assumption that we do the routine maintenance to the cart. Mr. Trayer, can you comment on the numbers, please? Sure. Um, as far as the uh, rounds of golf, the, the best that we've been able to do is capture area codes. So it's, it's the uh, Stanton area code of 24401, which I believe extends into Augusta County, is, is, is what I believe they were referring to. Um, so that would capture some Augusta County residents and not all Stanton. So. Vice Mayor Robertson. A uh, couple things. Um, Carolyn, I, Ms. Dole, I understand you said you want Stanton residents, but from as a business person, and I'm sure Mr. Holmes can tell you as well, I don't care whether somebody is coming from Stanton to play or Harrisonburg or Augusta County or D.C. That money spends all the same. You know, so it makes no difference dollar wise. I mean, if they're spending money at our golf course, we are making money. The other thing, and I debate whether I should even say this, but you know, you, you said you didn't like the idea of spending money on something where you didn't know the outcome. Well, I would venture to say, how can you say that when we are in the process of sinking 20 million into Staten Crossing and we don't know the outcome? So, now, the, the question I would have for James and, and, and uh, Wes is, if we order these 40 or 50 some carts, how we place the order today, how, what are we looking at? How long to get that? And if you'll answer that question, what would be, I also see in here phase two and phase three, if all of that is accomplished, how long down the road are we looking at that? Walt, would you want to answer that or you want me to take it? Go ahead. I'll talk about phase two and three. Sure. Um, the uh, last I'm sorry, this is, Con this is Councilwoman Mead. Before we go on to phase two and three, could I finish asking a couple of other questions? Let's uh, go ahead and address the question on the floor, please. And then you can um, address your questions, Councilwoman Mead. Uh, 
Mr. Robertson, to answer your question, uh, the last I spoke with the cart vendors, it would be a six to eight week period, depending on if we would place an order for carts before delivery. Okay. I, I would just add, Madam Mayor, that um, I think any decisions that are made about carts would be in the context of the budget for the fiscal year that begins July 1st. So the order may be able to be accommodated sooner than that, but we're talking about providing for this. Yeah, un understand, I'm just begins. trying to get a time frame that sure. you're looking at. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Robinson, as far as phase two and three, it does not have a time frame and it has everything to do with, can we generate enough income to take care of what we have and then go forward? That would be the main thing. These are plenty of, we probably had a hundred suggestions of things to do. Things are still coming in of things that we could possibly do, but <clears throat> we're clear-headed thinkers and we understand not everything can be done at once. And these things are just on the list and the list probably would grow as membership increases. So no time frame, sir. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Thank you all. Great. Councilwoman Mayor. Mead. Thank you. I'm gonna let Council, she was uh, requested first. Go ahead, Councilwoman. Mr. Corbett, you mentioned a business plan. Will, will we get that business plan before uh, before it's time for us to make a decision about the budget? In regards to the business plan, I think it was part, I was referencing to what the committee is suggesting as far as being part of a business plan in order for the golf course to move forward. I would be more than happy to construct an entire business plan for everyone if, if whatever direction council or the committee decides to go. Yeah, when I think of a business plan, I, I think of pro forma numbers based on projections, you know, how many, you know, what the pricing is going to be, how many members you have to sell to, uh, you have to have in order to meet the projections. That, that's really, you know, from my perspective, what, what, we're do, what we're doing here is asking the taxpayers to make an investment in a business venture. And, uh, and since we don't really have a track record to look at, I think, the, I, I think the, the rational thing to do is actually to have a business plan that, uh, that uses some of the information we have here. I mean, you have a new uh, pricing, uh, you have new proposed rates. Uh, and I think that's great that you're going to add five bucks here and there and a couple bucks there. Um, I have to say it's a, it, the proposed rate structure is pretty complicated, but, but uh, I can appreciate why it, we would be charging more for Friday to Saturday, 18 cart, uh, 18 holes with a cart than we would Monday through Thursday, 18 holes with a cart. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, um, you're, you're also... You also have a plan to put to reduce your membership fee from four hundred and fifty dollars down to three hundred dollars annually, and um, and and guarantee that rate for five years. We used to call that making it up on volume. Uh, That's correct. You know, you know, selling something at a loss, right, and then making it up on volume, which is uh, a, a little a little dicey. Can I give you an example based on the exact numbers that we proposed in this? Well, I, I'd love to see the numbers. Uh, I guess that's what I'm asking you. Yeah, for. sure. I'll give you an exact I, example yeah. right now if you'd like. So say like, if, just give you an example, looking at past revenue numbers. If we get a minimum of 100 members at what we propose, a $300 membership fee based on averages, what the average member plays in the United States is 39 and a half times a year based on membership. So say 40 times. So if we, if we just get the average of Gypsy Hill, which I think we would get more based on the entry point, the cost entry point we have, we would do $90,000 in revenue if each member played 40 times based on a $300 membership fee and, and the revenue from riding in the carts. If we did that 150 members, it would be $135,000 in revenue. That's just from members only. That is not counting any guest fees, any tournament fees, anything like that. That would blow away any revenue numbers that golf course has done in many years. Yeah, I, yeah kind of my point, I guess, we don't have a track record. Uh, so, it, so, you know, not, not having a track record, I think it's important for us to understand, you know, what, what your numbers are based on, what, you know, what your pro formas are. And I appreciate the fact that you have a tremendous amount of detail probably in your head. Uh, but I think we have a responsibility to make sure that uh, that it, it, it it's reasonable and rational on paper. Uh, it's a it's a it, we're asking the taxpayers to make an investment in a business here, 
And, and, uh, and, and I also, you know, uh, I've been doing a good bit of research uh, on the National Golf Foundation page. And, uh, and apparently uh, nearly every golf course in the country uh, saw increased uh, rounds played this year. And the National Golf Foundation refers to it as a COVID bump. And, uh, and, and the, the last thing I read was a caution that unless, uh, unless uh, golf courses have been able to keep track of who the new folks are who've been playing, that it's going to be awfully difficult to retain them. And so, uh, so you know, I, I don't think we should start off with numbers that reflect a COVID bump. I think we should, I think we should be more conservative in projecting the number of rounds that we might see played at Gypsy Hill. And, and I, you know, I think it might be a, a good time for me to state something. I am not opposed, I, I, and I'm not in favor, rather, of closing Gypsy Hill Golf Course, and I've never said that I was in favor of doing so. I want that to be very clear. But I also want to be very strategic, very, you know, we need to be careful about the finances here, because if we replace 55 golf carts, and, 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 and it was a COVID bump, uh, then, you know, we kind of go back down to where we used to be. Uh, so uh, so that, that's my concern. Council Member Claffey. I too am aware of today's article in the news leader where they uh, were talking about the bump in golf, calling it possibly a COVID bump. And they say they hadn't seen such interest on golf courses since the Tiger phenomenon of almost 20 years ago. And it, it's true, there's a ton of people out there playing in all these golf courses. And I think what we're failing to talk about is the children's youth programs. Now I know we're, we're trying to work a deal out with First Tee. They are interested in coming to Gypsy Hill and assisting our new generation to get on the golf course. And, and many of people my generation were able to take advantage of a great facility and we all revere N.L. Deaver, whose drive you drive up to go up there. And he did a great job, and he got a bunch of us out there. And we, he kept us 50, 60 years later. We're still interested in keeping that golf course going. Now, I know there's a complaint about the irrigation system that was invested many years ago. But the truth of the matter is, Gypsy Hill Golf Course this past summer was in spectacular shape because of the irrigation system. The fairways did not burn out. The greens were good all season. The carts were terrible. Everybody in the valley knows how bad our carts are because we haven't invested in them in numbers of years. If we could just get 50 carts going, start doing some tournaments, get some people out there, get some kids out there, it will boom. So we've got to take care of our part. I, I can test the, the Councilwoman Mead's business plan all the time. Is the business plan for the swimming pool to make money? But think about it. If you go out there and drop $15 for a, a, a round of golf, most of that money, if you rent a car, will end up as profit. There is money to be made if we have carts. We don't have carts. We're not making money. And everybody wants to say, well, you don't have a business plan. It's any way you cut it, you have to invest some money to get this thing going. I want to thank Walter and his ad hoc committee for doing a lot of work and, and spelling it out and, and showing that there is a lot of interest in Stanton in golf. Thank you, Walter. Thanks, Walter. Council member. Um, Go ahead, Amy Dorby. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mayor Oaks. Um, I would like to say first, thank you to the committee for the work that you've done. And I just have one uh, question. Uh, the recommendations that you're giving us today, was that a, a consensus of the eight committee members that worked on this? Uh, I'll answer that. It, it certainly was. And we've had uh, six meetings, I guess, to date. And that was all worked seamlessly as a group. Uh, and absolutely, uh, everybody has been given this uh, well ahead of time and asked to review it. And if they had any questions or concerns as individual committee members, 
please let us know. And there were some things that were tweaked, but overall the committee uh, was well satisfied. Thank you. Um, Council Member Holmes. Uh, I just wondered if we could do this like uh, half the carts this year and then maybe next year buy the other half because it's a lot of money to be putting out at one time when we've got a lot of other problems around town that we need to worry about. And I mean, that's a, I don't, I'm, I'm like Brenda. I don't, I don't want to see the golf course closed. I don't want that to happen. But also I'm just a little worried about spending a lot of money now, you know, and it's kind of like field of dreams, you know, you, you think it's going to happen, but you know, it might not. And that way, if we, if it does, we invest in like 25 cards, then, then, you know, if it, if it takes off, then we get the other 25 the next year. You know, I just, I just think that maybe that we could stretch it out a little bit over, over time. Hey, I, um, I have a question. Um, this question is for Chris Tuttle. Uh, Mr. Tuttle, do you endorse the committee's recommendations? Yes, ma'am. Um, all the staff that participated uh, endorse the uh, recommendations of the committee. Would you like to add any further comments? Well, I'd like to thank the committee. It was a, it was a, a good group, very detailed in, in their the final product. Uh, a lot of thought and consideration was given to all aspects as well as the cost uh, to replace the fleet. It was a, uh, we realized it's a, it's a major issue for us to move forward, uh, to give us a chance to be successful right now, we can. Vice Mayor Robertson. Mr. Tuttle, when was the last time that we purchased any golf carts? I believe, and James, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it was 2011. Ten years. We purchased one in 2017 with some left side. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. But before that, it's been, yeah, 2010, actually. 2010, so 20, wow, okay. 21 years. I mean, yeah. 11 years. 11 years ago. But it was just, that was just a small amount of cards. The last major purchase we had right. was the year 2000. Okay. I think this question will be for you, um, Chris Tuttle. Um, how long will, will it take um, with the path that we're on right now um, to be able to regain the cost of the carts if we were to purchase the 44 carts or uh, 50? <laughs> well, I don't have the specifics of when they – but they will immediately start paying for themselves. Uh, James, you have did you have some documentation on that? I do. If if we did absolutely nothing different, no numbers went up, nothing different, just by raising the just cart fee two dollars with the new cart, we would have the cards paid for in seven and a half years. If we did nothing, if we improved no numbers at all. Okay. Based on the based on what we've done the past year. Uh, this is Brenda Mead. I, I, I just uh, I want to add again or, or state again that that uh, a a COVID bump in rounds isn't necessarily going to mean you're going to do the same next year that we've done this year. And and so I, I just want to make sure we we make that point. And I also think we need to stop uh, this sort of I think uh, equiv equiv making the golf course and the and the swimming pool, for instance, putting them on the same level is, is, is not really, um, uh, it's not a good comparison. Um, I think something like 15,000 uh, people use the pool every year, or we get 15,000 entrances into the pool. I'm sure a lot of the same families, and we don't know whether they're from Stanton or whether they're from Augusta County. I'm sure there's probably about a 50-50 mix um, from our swimming pools, uh, it, it's just that, you know, 15,000 uh, entrances into our swimming pools. And the, the barrier to entry uh, for a swimming pool is, you know, you a pair of flip-flops and a towel and a swimming suit. Uh, and I hear what everyone's saying about there's always plenty of equipment available at the golf course. Uh, I, I, in fact, donated a set of clubs this year to the golf course, and I hope they're being used. Um, but um, we, we just, I, I, I appreciate again, Mr. Corbett, the fact that you have a great command of all these numbers. 
I just like to see, I, I just want to see them. I'd like to see what that business plan looks like. And, and I did attend the first tee presentation at the last uh, golf uh, club, at, uh, the advisory committee meeting. And, and, uh, and, and, the, and the executive director of that group is a very enthusiastic um, and dedicated person. I really appreciated everything he had to say. I, I will note that uh, it, he, he covers a fairly large region uh, and that he had a total of 200 uh, kids in his program in the most recent year. Not, not this, since the school had been closed, I think he used 2019 numbers because there were probably more representative, but 200 youth across a region that, that uh, spans from, uh, from uh, Rockingham County or Rockridge County all the way up to Shenandoah County and, and uh, part, of, part of the North. It, it's new for him, a lot of that's new, but I, I still think, you know, uh, the, the program's a good one. Uh, it has a lot of great goals. It does require financial support. Uh, it requires donations. Um, I think you mentioned that uh, that uh, that's, that there would be some subsidies uh, related to the first T program. I I'd, uh, I'd like to know who we have lined up to subsidize that uh, in the city. And I'd also like to see if we have that program here in Stanton uh, that we have a member of the community on the board of First T. If you look at their board of directors currently. Uh, they have board members from across the, the Shenandoah Valley, and I'd like to make sure that we're represented on that board as well. And I'm sure they would be happy to accommodate. Madam Mayor. Councilman I, Clappy. If I may uh, speak about First Tee, I, I've served with your program for the last couple of years, and it was originally called First Tee of Harrisonburg. Most of their figures from 2018 and 19 were all generated in the Harrisonburg area, and they have a nice facility up there beside that golf course. Um, they have expanded into many more counties like, like Councilwoman Mead just mentioned, and that's why they're coming into the Stanton area now. So they have changed their name to First Tee Shenandoah to show that it's, a, you know, it's an expanding thing. And that's why I wanna get us involved because we really haven't had many First Tee participants at Gypsy Hill because we haven't had the ability to have a program over there. We have had a program going on at Ironwood Country Club for the last couple of years, and it has been successful. These programs don't instantly start out as a success. You have to build them. And it's a great program. And if we would get involved and invest, we would get our money back in, in, the, in our youth dollars and that's what it's all about getting these kids out there that's where they learn need to learn how to play a gypsy hill golf course so i'm a big advocate of first tee i'm a big advocate of gypsy hill and i hope we can get this thing going our rounds will continue to increase do not think we just had a covid bump this past year we turned people down at gypsy hill golf course because they couldn't get a cart now i'm i'm like to play golf, but I'm not going out there and walking that course. <laughs> it ain't easy. <laughs> it's a tough course to walk. And, uh, you know, if you can't get a cart, you're going to say, no, I'll go play somewhere else. So, therefore, I think it's essential that we get the carts and get things rolling, allow us to have the tournaments, allow us to get the use, and it will all pay off because we have, like we have an irrigation system and a good golf course out there. And the articles I have read, this is uh, Mayor Oaks, the articles I have read, it said that it's um, not just a matter of folks getting out because of COVID. Um, it's a matter of introducing a new sport to many people that have never experienced it before. And they've been, um, they've been enlightened and they want to continue on with this sport. Um, so what I've read has said that i uh, this trend should continue onward. Um, the trend um, had a, a boost in 2007 with Tiger Woods and once again in um, 2020. And from what I'm reading in golf magazines, it's saying that the trend should continue because it's a matter of introducing um, a sport that people have not tried before and they're loving it. Now, my thoughts as far as mentioning the swimming pool, um, I can only assume that that's being brought up because it's all under Parks and Rec. 
their fee structure is quite different than what we would have with the golf course. Um, and as far as um, uh, Stanton Crossan was mentioned, I was on the council that voted to move forward with the purchase of Stanton Crossing. We did that because it was foresight. And for me, this investment is about foresight for the future of our city. And I, um, I have a lot of faith in the committee that was formed and I believe they've done a remarkable job and I would like to thank each and every one of you. And thank you, um, Mr. Obenchain for being willing to be the chair of this committee and everyone's hard work. So thank you so much. Um, Walt, did you have any last comments? Uh, no, other than to say thank you, Mayor and members of council for hearing us out. This is informational. And as Ms. Mead has asked, uh, I fully expected that someone would have something that they would need for later on, and we'll certainly get you get that to you before you have to make a vote. Again, this is informational. No one's voting on anything tonight. And anything and everything that any of you may have in the way of questions before the time comes that you vote on the capital improvement plan, uh, please let me know, and, and I'll make sure we get those questions answered and whatever else you might need between now and the time that the vote comes to fruition. So thanks, all of you, for listening to us. And thank you for your service. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you all. We are now on break. We will return at 6.15. Okay, it's 6.15, so we're ready uh, to go back into the work session. The next item, which is item number three, is a presentation on Middle River Regional Jail Expansion Project. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is give council just a little bit of background, um, and then my comments will be followed by two presentations, one by uh, the superintendent of the Middle River Regional Jail, Jeff Newton, and a second shorter presentation by Phil Trayer, the city's chief finance officer. Uh, several council members are, are relatively new to council, so uh, for the, largely for their benefit as a refresher for other members of council and for the public's benefit, let me just provide a little bit of background about the Middle River Regional Jail. It's owned by the Middle River Regional Jail Authority. And there are five localities that are members of that authority. They are the cities of Harrisonburg, Waynesboro, and Stanton, and the counties of Augusta and Rockingham. So those five localities are the owners, if you will, uh, of the authority and each one of those localities has three members of the authority's board which sits as the governing body of the authority and so uh, and and those authority board members hold their positions by virtue of their positions with the member localities so it's um typically the chief administrative officer a finance official and uh, the uh, and a law enforcement official, and so in Stanton, um, you have three authority board members: Phil Trayer, the chief finance officer; Sheriff Matt Robertson, who joins us for this presentation on Zoom, and myself. And together, we are Stanton's representatives on the authority board. With respect to an expansion project, there are two levels of approval that are required for any expansion project. And I think Mr. Newton may touch on this in his presentation, but it doesn't hurt to make the point more than once. So at some point in the, in the near future, the authority board on which I sit with Mr. Chair and Sheriff Robertson will be asked to consider a proposed expansion to the jail for formal action. And the 15 members of the authority board will vote on the proposed expansion. Then whatever project is approved by the authority board has to run the circuit of the five localities. Mm -hmm. And under the organizational documents for the authority, 
four out of the five localities, the governing bodies of four out of the five localities have to then approve the project that was approved by the authority board. So it takes two different levels of approval, the authority board, then four out of five governing bodies of the member localities in order to move forward. And if that doesn't happen, then we don't have an approved project. So that, that just sort of sets the stage for you in terms of what's required going forward. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff Newton, the superintendent of Middle River Regional Jail and invite him to make his presentation. Council members should have a hard copy of this of both presentations, both Mr. Newton's and Mr. Chair's and council members Bill and Mead um, ought to have received electronic versions of the same presentation so that you can follow along. Welcome. Well, Madam Mayor, members of council, Mr. Rosberg, thank you very much for taking time from what I'm sure is your busy schedule to uh, listen to me talk about potential jail expansion. I understand you have a paper copy of uh, the items I'd like to talk to you about. We could move to the agenda. Those are the, uh, the items that uh, I'm hoping to cover with you tonight. Just give you a little bit of background, reinforce what Mr. Rosenberg said about the establishment of the authority. Then I wanna talk a little bit about the administrative process that we need to go through from the state level to get approval for an expansion project that happens even before we come talk to you. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the history we've done, how this project has evolved over the last couple of years talk about the refined scope that we've generally fell upon. Then I'll present to you a potential option. This is simply um, an option that uh, has potential. It is certainly not an option that anybody in the authority has determined is going to be the project. That is still, uh, in fact, there, there is no decision that we're actually gonna do a project. I'll, I'll make sure you clearly understand that. Next slide, please. For those that uh, may not be aware of where the jail resides, we're just north. You can see I've placed arrows on that slide for you that demonstrate where we are in right relationship to the Augusta County Government Center. It's to the west of us. The uh, youth center is just to the south. So we sit in that industrial park behind the Augusta County Government Center in between Commerce Avenue and uh, Interstate 81. Next slide. So the jail authority uh, was established in uh, 2006 with the original membership of two cities of Waynesboro and Augusta County and operated as such till about 215 when the communities of Harrisburg <coughs> and County of Rockingham joined as full members. So they added their two jurisdictions. They also have three members from those jurisdictions. They have all the rights as a member of the authority that uh, the original members have. The jail was designed originally with a rated capacity of 396 offenders. That's an important number to remember as we move through our presentation. But the core of the building, the main complex, was designed to potentially serve up to 600. So the kitchen, the medical unit, hot water, the HVAC system, laundry, those core systems were designed anticipating that you probably were gonna have more folks than 396. So it was designed for 150% capacity. That's roughly about 600 offenders. As you can see, we haven't had just 600 offenders for quite, enough, quite a while. Last year in calendar year 20, our average daily population was 843, with 337 of those offenders uh, on house arrest. And we need to keep in mind that 2020 was a fairly unusual year. COVID kind of changed a lot of things and it depressed the jail population. And uh, so that's why that average is down. If you go to the next slide, you can see what our historical population has been for the three years prior to that. So we've been operating at 200% capacity for the last four years. Uh, 2019 was an exceptional, uh, stressful year as we were at 233% capacity. Next slide. So how does expansion of a jail in the Commonwealth of Virginia occur? 
you have to uh, conduct what's called a community-based corrections plan. So the jail authority in uh, 2018 determined to do that, published an RFP and selected an architectural firm to conduct that. It's generally an architectural firm that conducts the community-based corrections plan. Why? Community-based corrections plan has two pieces. There's a needs assessment, which determined what is the population need for that facility for the next 10 years. And then there's a planning study, which develops a solution to meet that population need. So you need to design something, some physical plant to meet that need. So the community-based corrections plan was conducted. It determined that we need 1,283 beds come 2029. We have 396, so we need about 800 new beds in the next 10 years. So the planning study came up with several options. Those were presented to the jail authority. Jail authority approved the submission of the community-based corrections plan to the state. And it gets submitted to the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections has staff that this is what they do. Um, they review the plan, they uh, verify and agree with the population analysis, and they agree with whatever design is presented. So I'm gonna review real quick for you in a couple slides what the, what the design was, but the jail authority determined to submit the plan with the largest design. And we did that and we asked them to do that because if you get a project approved, it's easier to build something smaller than it is to go back and say, we need more money and we need to build something bigger. So it's easier to scale a project back than it is to um, scale a project up. And so the board adopted a resolution that said basically that to approve the submission of the community-based corrections plan with this option, with the full knowledge that we have the option to build something smaller or do nothing at all. So all we did was uh, authorize the submission of the plan. The Department of Corrections reviewed the plan, approved the plan, and then submitted the community-based corrections plan for approval to the Board of Local and Regional Jails. This is the state agency that controls jail standards and how jails are operated in the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is the new agency that the uh, governor and the legislature designated to do death investigations. It used to be called the Board of Corrections. They relabeled it um, the Board of Local and Regional Jails in the last regular session. That body met. It's a group of individuals that are appointed by the governors. They, rep they represent a cross-section of um, citizens. There's doctors and there's psychiatrists and there's architects and there's, it's a group of uh, professional folks. They met and uh, re reviewed and approved the community-based corrections plan in September of 2020. And then that gets submitted to the state and it needs to be funded. So it gets submitted to the state as part of the next fiscal year's budget. Governor Northam did not include the project in his draft budget that he submitted in uh, 2022. Have I got ahead of myself? No, I'm still unsure. All right, uh, so what we've done is we have approached uh, Delegate Avoli and Senator Hanger's office and uh, they have each submitted a budget amendment that would allow this project to be considered by the legislature during the deliberations of this next fiscal year budget. So that's the status of the administrative process. We've met all the requirements for the plan to be considered. And even doing all this does not require the jail authority and member jurisdiction to do anything. It just makes the project eligible for state reimbursement if a project is completed. So let's talk about, I'm on the slide that talks about historical options. So I think it's the next slide for you. So these are the historical options we developed as part of the community-based directions plan. I just, I just included them here simply as reference so you can see how the project has evolved over the last few years. We asked them, so, Option A was a pretty aggressive plan. It was an expensive plan, but it provided the potential for 800 beds over the next 10 years. The initial plan would request authorization for an increase in our rate of capacity from 396 to 796, but we would build the physical plant so we could eventually go back later and ask for the additional authorization for 400 beds without an expensive construction project. So it was pretty aggressive. 
as according to the folks that I talked to, innovative in that we were building with today's money for future need. Option B looked exactly like option A, except it didn't have the additional space for the additional 400 beds. If you wanted 400 beds in the future, you'd have to build something else. Option C was uh, more limited in scope, really focused more on uh, providing and meeting uh, a demanding need for community corrections as a separate building as opposed to part of the main physical plant, but adding another 200 minimum custody beds in the facility. All of them addressed core needs, expanding support services, expanding administrative space, all those core pieces were all included in each of the options. Any questions about those? Um, option C yes, says uh, no mental health beds. That's um, correct. Okay. Right. None of these options are what I'm gonna to talk to you about later as a potential option. I only present these so that you can see how we've evolved and how we've changed and reshaped the project in response to questions from board members, understanding where we need to be better as a staff okay. as we've evolved through this process. All right. Thank you. Once we got the community-based corrections plan approved, the chairman of the board, Mr. King, who's uh, administrator in Rockingham County, requested that we come back at our December of 20 meeting to review the options, to review the community-based corrections plan. So we did that. As a result of that meeting, it was pretty clear to me that there was no appetite on the board for a huge project. And frankly, there didn't appear much excitement on the board for any of the projects we scoped out. So after that meeting, I asked uh, Mosley and my staff to come back and let, uh, let's break this project down into smaller pieces so that if we're gonna achieve or we're gonna move forward to the project, we need to have something that the board members can tailor to what they think need, better meets the needs of our jurisdictions. So we did that and we presented that updated uh, analysis to the finance committee uh, before Christmas on the 21st. And then we forwarded it out to all the board members and then the chairman called a special meeting for January 7th for a focused session just to look at those new options. And we did that. And we really focused on five areas in this uh, new analysis of potential expansion. There are some renovation needs that we need to focus on the facility. We've got 15 years of age. Uh, we've, we've really stressed the building hard by being overpopulated for a number of years. So we've got some core functions we need to do and we need to expand those core services for serving a greater population. We needed to focus more on community corrections, which is a growing need for us. We need to focus and provide additional space to better serve those in our custody with an underlying mental health issue. We needed to create new capacity for minimum custody beds, general population beds, so we could appropriately manage the population in our custody. And with the original construction of the, of the facility, there was a maintenance facility included in the original design plan that was value engineered out early in the process. Since that time, we have constructed a small maintenance building, but it's been clear to us that we don't have adequate maintenance space to meet the demands of the facility nor do we have adequate storage space for supplies and services to meet the demand of our increased population. Next slide. So the next slide is highlighting the areas of the facility that we'd like to renovate that are gonna, that we need to change. So the first area is the kitchen space. That's currently, what's highlighted in gray there is currently storage. We wanna, we wanna make that production space. So we're gonna take that out and later on we'll Propose some additional storage. <clears throat> when we constructed the building, we stubbed out inside the secure perimeter two spaces for professional visitation for attorneys and counselors to meet with clients. We only built out one of those. We want to build out the we want to build out the other one so we can expand our capacity to meet the demand of professional folks that need to meet with their clients. We want to provide additional security in our lobby for our staff. The nature of our communities has changed and environment has changed. We need to uh, do that. The big square area is our current medical unit. We wanna repurpose that for a mental health administrative space. And we're proposing to build a larger 
medical clinic to better serve our growing population, meet the demands of our population. The smaller square that you see there is currently a housing unit. Uh, we don't have enough storage for property for offenders. Remember, our core systems were designed for 150% capacity, about 600. With 800 folks, we can't store all the property that folks bring into custody. So we want to create, we want to add some additional storage space for inmate property. And the last piece there is magistrate office. We do have a magistrate office at the jail. It's inside the secure perimeter of the facility. It's not accessible to the public. We want to move it outside the secure perimeter and make it more accessible to the public and still be able to serve the needs of the folks that are in our custody. Any questions about that? Those are the renovation pieces. Next slide. Next slide addresses the concern for increasing capacity to better serve uh, the mental health population. There are two, uh, there are several areas of the jail that were prepositioned for potential expansion. These are two of those areas. And uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll show them to you. So that's male housing you're looking at. And there were two housing units, one on each of those pods that was not constructed. We're proposing to build those. They'd have 24 cells each, and they would complete that particular section of the facility. And we would purpose those for serving the folks in our custody with mental health needs. Questions about that? Next slide. Next slide addresses the concern for expanding uh, and meeting demands for minimum custody inmates. Jail standards require you build and have 30% of your beds for minimum custody, 40% for medium custody, and 30% for maximum security custody. I've never worked at a jail that needs 30% of their beds for maximum custody. Our maximum custody population is generally between five and 8%. So we're not proposing to build any maximum custody beds. They're expensive to build and we just don't need them. And that's why we're focused on minimum custody beds. So we'd end up with a larger percentage of minimum custody beds than jail standards requires. But I think that more closely matches the need of our jurisdictions um, as we move forward. If you go to the next slide, please. So you can see that's another highlighted area that was intended as potential expansion. Uh, the housing unit just to the right of that is currently our female housing unit. We're proposing to build a unit there that would have 192 beds, that would build, be built dormitory style, uh, 48 beds in each of the four dormitories for 192 beds. Any questions? Next slide. Next slide is a proposal that addresses uh, demand for community corrections. Prior to COVID, we had a very robust community corrections program, work release, community service. Those offenders were housed at the main jail. They would leave the main jail, go to work, come back at night. Since COVID, our work release program is not as robust. We have about 50 to 60 offenders a day on work release, but they're required to live at home, so they're on house arrest. Uh, was a, we suspended our work release program in March because we were concerned about controlling movement in and out of the facility. And then in July, we met with the Commonwealth Attorneys in the court and uh, restarted the program with a house arrest component. Now, I have folks in my custody that I think are appropriate for work release, but the Commonwealth Attorney and the, and the court are not comfortable with them living at home and being on work release. They want, them, want it to be a residential program. We're not prepared to restart a residential program yet with COVID. So this proposal is for a separate building uh, in the parking lot of the facility, be 112 beds. We focused on community service, work release, re-entry. That's the focus of this proposal. I would like to note uh, the third bullet that city staff here in Stanton are not as excited about this potential as I am. And uh, so I wanna highlight that for you. But I want to remind everybody that this is not this is not the approved plan. This is not something that you know anybody is determined we can do. It's just highlighting one of the ways that we could tailor the various options that are available for the authority board to meet future needs of the of the authority. So the next slide tells you or shows you graphically where 
this would be, it would really be in between the youth center and, uh, and the jail. Uh, wouldn't have any support service functions in it. All the food service, medical, all that stuff would come from the jail to, uh, to that facility. I've operated uh, three different facilities the same way. It works and functions very well that way. And it's much more economical to build that way. Any questions about that particular facility? Next slide, please. Next slide talks about the core of the building that we need to expand. So we talked about um, medical unit repurposing the current med administrative medical unit for mental health administration. We need a much larger medical unit with more cells so that the clinic can better serve the population that needs to be monitored more closely while they're in our custody. We need to add food service storage back in that we took out by adding production space. We need a new inmate laundry. So where, we, where the laundry is positioned in the current physical plant is inside the secure perimeter and what it's surrounded with uh, makes it incapable for us to expand that particular laundry. We just, can't expect, we just physically cannot expand it without a great deal of expense. It's much more economical just to add a different laundry onto the building so we can meet the demand for the increase in population. Then of course, we need to add some administrative space. We've grown, we're larger than we were. Uh, we don't have enough space for finance, HR, all the other services that we need to provide to the, uh, to the population. The next slide graphically shows you where that would be. It would just be an extension of the current administrative area. Uh, where we're proposing to put it does not impinge upon the authority's ability to expand inmate housing in that area if there was a need at some point in time in the future. So I think it's positioned in, a, in the right spot. Questions about potential support service need? Last slide is uh, just a, a graphic representation of where a maintenance and warehouse facility would be placed. It's really in between the Augusta County Government Center and the main jail. There's currently a small maintenance building right there. So the, all the utilities and stuff we would need are there. Next slide. So the next slide is summarizing all the dollar figures that you've seen as you've gone through this presentation. Details out the expense of each particular one. So you could pick, take something out, put something else in. Uh, there were I didn't provide you the slide that's got all the all the options that were available because uh, it's a pretty busy slide and it's hard to understand because it's not big enough to show you graphically. So the first column is uh, describes what the project is. Column to the right is the expense of the project. The next column is what the state share of that would be. Uh, the next column would be the cost to the authority. So this particular option is about $39.5 million. I realize that's a lot of money. The cost, the share from the state would be about 10 million. This has the potential to add 352 beds to the authority. Any questions about that? Terry Holmes. Um... Do you look at our, our population growing that much in, in the jail? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, do you look at our, our, our uh, prison population growing that much? Well, we're 800 a day with another 60 out on house arrest. So my population is 860 today. Adding these 352 beds doesn't give us doesn't get us to 860 today. Don't we have a lot of state uh, prisoners that should have gone to other we prisons? Do. We do. We have today about one in four of our offenders belong to the Department of Corrections. Today, I, ju I just saw a report today that there are 5,600, north, just north of 5,600 offenders that belong in state prison that are being housed in state and local jails across the Commonwealth. There are only three jails that have more state 
inmates that belong in the Department of Corrections in Middle River. All three of those jails have a rated bed capacity over 1,000. We have a rated bed capacity of 356. The backup of inmates that belong in the Department of Corrections in local jails is not a new issue. Prior to our issues somewhat exacerbated by COVID, the Department of Corrections suspended transfer of all inmates to the Department of Corrections in March of last year, did not restart again until September, and have moved very few folks since that point. That's why we're at 5,600. But prior to COVID, there were, I mean, I've been running jails in a Commonwealth now for over 10 years. It fluctuated between, I think, a low of 2,800 to a high of 6,000 in those 10 years. So this is not a new issue. Right? It's, a, it's a recurring issue. Uh, but I think it's been exacerbated by COVID. So if you, if you take those 200 out, you're never going to get all 200 in the Department of Corrections. You may get half of them, right? So then our population is going to be 760. And that these new beds would get you at 760. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm capable of predicting uh, what the future is going to be. We've done our best effort with that, with the community-based corrections plan. Uh, but uh, I hope that's, that answers your question. Well, it, I, I just didn't understand why a lot of these guys weren't going to the state. But I, I guess you've answered that with the fact of COVID. Do they just not have enough beds themselves? Uh, to absorb well, this many people? Councilman Holmes, that's an excellent question. Um, the Department of Corrections does not have a rated bed capacity like we do. But if you look at the data from the Department of Corrections, they've got between 29 and 28,000 folks in custody at state prison. But it's interesting to know that since 2016, the number of people they're housing has dropped a thousand a day, while yours has increased. So they used to house over 29,000, now they're housing just about 28,000. I don't know why, um, but when and who moves to the Department of Corrections is the responsibility and the authority of the Department of Corrections. We do not influence that. We do not control that. It's their absolute authority to determine who goes and when. Thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Vice Mayor Roberts. Madam Mayor, if I may, um, I, I'm concerned about Mr. Newton getting through his presentation and Mr. Trayer then getting through his half a dozen slides. So I'd like to suggest that if council members would be willing to hold their questions until the presentations are completed, um, we can be sure to cover the material that we think it's important for council to hear. Right. Is that all right, Vice Mayor? Oh, yeah. okay. Please continue. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. That next slide is, I'm not going to read you the next slide. It's just the cost assumptions we made in developing the budgetary, potential budgetary impact. Um, you can read that and review that as you as you please. The next slide is the potential budget increase to the authority if this particular option was chosen. You can see that uh, total cost is about 13.4 in 2024. The compensation board share for the framing of salary cost is about 5 million. And so the two cost is about $8.4 million increase to your current operating budget. And then you can see we've detailed it out for the next four years after that. Next slide. Next slide just summarizes um, the decision points that we need to make if the project is to proceed on the schedule that is uh, mapped out. Jail Authority meets next week, as Mr. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg said for consideration of this particular issue. And then it lays out um, the other decision points between now and July 1st. At the backdrop of all this is that we need to make sure and ensure that if we want to do a project, we need to make sure that whatever that project is, is included in the state budget. Uh, if it's not included in the state budget, there's no guarantee you get a 25% match. Last slide. So criminal justice reform. 
a lot of activity in a special session um, that occurred uh, this last spring, and there's a great deal of activity that's occurring in the current legislative session. I wanna highlight two pieces uh, that I think are relevant immediately to um, Middle River. The piece that came out of the last leg, the special session was a directive to the Department of Corrections to change earn good time that individuals in the Department of Corrections can potentially earn off their sentence. Currently, they earn five days for every 30 days served. They passed a bill that allows for it's an incentive-based bill that is focused on rehabilitation and if an offender participates in required rehabilitation, they can earn potentially up to 15 days per month off their sentence. The, the Department of Corrections has until July of 22 to come back to the legislature and explain to them how they're gonna implement that. So it's not an immediate impact. Uh, our best estimates working with the Compensation Board and the Department of Corrections, we anticipate that's gonna uh, impact uh, immediately about 1400 offenders because it is retroactive to people currently in custody. So we did some math and that means about potentially 60 offenders that we might reduce middle river jail population uh, based on that. If that 1,400 inmates was applied equally across the Commonwealth to all the jails. So, our population projection for 2024 is 1,060. So, we, we presented that to the board and we said, okay, now we, we think maybe it might, might be 1,000. I don't know what criminal justice reform is going to come out of this next legislative session. I know that the uh, Senate uh, Legislative Committee has passed out a recommendation for elimination of mandatory minimum sentences. So, what does that mean for Middle River Regional Jail? I don't think it means anything because it'll change how long somebody serves in the Department of Corrections, but they're likely to still be at Middle River Regional Jail until the court decides what that sentence might be. So as an example, somebody's accused of a crime, 10 year mandatory sentence. Well, they end up with a sentence of eight years. They still spent that time in Middle River. They're still gonna go to the Department of Corrections. We may see some impact as that gets applied in the next two, three years and those folks matriculate through the system, we may see some and likely will see impact five, six years down the road as those folks get sentenced, earn, serve less time and come back out, especially with the changes to earn good time. So I think there's some potential in the future. It's not gonna impact us today or any time I think in the next couple, three, four years. So, there's a couple other comments there, but I'll leave it at that. And, um, I think that's all I have, Mr. Rosenberg, if you want to, I'll get out of Bill's way. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you. And, um, hey, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Treyer. As um, he, so as, as Mr. Chair makes his way to the podium, let me just touch on one point that Mr. Newton made to be absolutely clear at, at one point, he suggested that uh, city staff is not excited about the community corrections element. And he and I have discussed this, we've communicated about this. I wanna be very clear, we're in, very enthusiastic about community corrections. Our, our discussions have centered on whether the project ought to include a 192 bed minimum security addition plus a 112 bed community corrections addition or whether uh, whether a smaller facility perhaps 192 beds can serve both purposes both the minimum security and the community corrections so we're very enthusiastic about community corrections as you'll hear mr chair explain we have some concerns about the overall cost to the authority and therefore the city mm -hmm. of the potential option that Mr. Newton has described to you here this evening. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and um, invite Mr. Yeah, Chair. I, I apologize, Madam Mayor. That, that, I, I certainly did not want you to assume that staff was not excited about community corrections. That's my fault. It's in it's in the bullets of the slide. I just didn't specifically sure, state no. that. So no need you know, for an this, apology, this, Mr. Newton. That's right. I just want I just don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to mislead you in any way. There, I think there. I don't think there's anybody on the authority that isn't supportive of efforts, historical and potential future efforts towards re-entry and community corrections. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Treyer. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight we are here to discuss the potential option offered by Mr. Newton 
and out that, that was outlined in slides 19 through 21 of his presentation, which calls for an additional 304 rated capacity beds, plus an additional 48 mental health beds. We will also offer a possible alternative, which we will review shortly. Before we review the impact of these options, we'd like to provide some background information for you to have while reviewing the upcoming options. On slide two, reviews history of Stan's contributions to the Middle River Regional Jail since 2016 as a base year. As can be seen, Stanton has increased his support of the jail by $1.1 million or 85% since 2016. 75% of this increase, or $825,000, has occurred in just the last two years. Jail staff initial budget for FY22 presented last week to the Middle River Regional Jail Finance Committee calls for an additional $1.3 million from the city of Stanton, oh. representing a 54% increase over FY21's appropriation of $2.4 million. It is uncertain whether this level of increase will survive the budget process, which leaves the final amount to be determined. Because of the increasing cost of the jail to Stanton, city staff has developed another alternative expansion option, which focuses on increasing the workers' lease and minimal custody housing. On slide three, provides a history of bed rental expense at the Middle River Regional Jail since 2016 base year. Bed rental expense occurs when staff reduces the inmate count at the jail by housing inmates at other regional jails within the state of Virginia. The cost associated with this practice is currently $55 per day per inmate plus medical costs. As can be seen on the slide between FY16 and 19, there were no budget or actual bed rental expenses. Average daily population was 744 and 16, 830 and 17, 878 and 18, and 923 and 19. FY20's average population equaled 853 with a bed rental if not, with a bed rental expense budget of $250,000, so no expenses were recorded. FY21's budgeted average daily population equals 875 with a budgeted bed rental of 250. No expenses so far, but the staff at the jail fully anticipates using the full $250,000 by the end of this fiscal year. FY22's initial budget proposed presented at last week's finance committee meeting includes a request of bed rental of $2,007,000. Middle River Regional Jail staff projections for subsequent years run as high as $4.9 million in FY24. Slide four outlines the local effort required by Stan for the option summarized in slides 19 and 21 of Mr. Newton's presentation. Again, this expansion equates to an additional 304 rated capacity beds for a total rated capacity of seven, uh, 700 beds. For personnel costs, we took 9,335,000 from slide 21 and multiplied it by 20.2%, which is Stan's portion of inmate population. And this gives us $1,885,000. Middle, Regional, Middle River Regional Jail has used personnel costs, which is based upon a rate of capacity of 796 beds in an attempt to help the jail bridge the gap between current staffing levels and recommended staffing levels for the current inmate population. Other costs consist of increases in utilities, insurance, maintenance, new building and operation costs. Again, we take the 2,023 from slide 21, multiply it by 20.2% gives us $408,000. Comp board reimbursements, this is the amount the state puts towards the jail operation and is apportioned in accordance with standards percentage of the inmate, in the inmate population. From slide 25, we take the 4.9 million times 20.2 gives us 991,000. Debt service is based on the locality's 75% share of total project costs of 39,466, netted down to 29,599. This number can be found on slide 19 in Mr. Newton's presentation. The state share of this project is 25%, 9.8 million. Debt service is modeled at 30 year amortization, 5% interest. Total projected annual cost increase to stand under this version is $1.7 million. The real estate tax equivalent of this, you would take the $1.7 million divided by $205,000, which is the amount of tax is raised on one cent of real estate tax. This equates to the equivalent of 8.25 cents. While no one is calling for a tax increase, it is important to try to put this additional cost in perspective.
Slide five outlines operational costs associated with the alternative city, city staff to develop. We asked Middle River Regional Jail staff to cost out our option. In response, the jail presented an expense model showing the city's costs associated with our smaller alternative expansion exceeding Mr. Newton's potential option by over 600,000. This variance is driven entirely by the inclusion of a bed rental provision of $4.9 million, 983,000 or 20.2% would be Stanton's, Stanton's share. Given the history of bed rental costs, an operational capacity increase of uh, 288 general population beds plus 48 mental health beds, providing an operational capacity under the Stanton option of 400, 946 beds, we question the need for bed rentals, especially to such an extent. Accordingly, we modeled our option without the bed rental expense. Personnel costs were provided based on a bed rated capacity of 588 beds, rather than the 796 rated bed capacity, which is used in the Middle River Regional Jail staff's potential option. Costs provided by the staff equal $8.2 million, 88.5% of the potential option. Multiplied by stand share of 20.2 equals personnel cost of 1,669. The disproportionate increase in staffing expenses is designed to close the gap between current staffing levels and recommended staffing levels for the current inmate population. Other costs reported by the jail staff for alternative equals $517,000, including food services, health services, transportation, direct jail support, operational capital, contingency, and new building operation. Stand share would be $104,000. Total net annual increase to stand under this alternative is $1,348,000. The tax equivalent, the real estate tax equivalent of this is 6.57 cents. Slide six outlines certain factors we considered in developing an alternative approach. Operational capacity, has been based upon 150% of rated bed capacity, which tracks with the core support facility limitations. And this is addressed in all options. Currently inmates are doubled and even triple bunked at the facility, with, which has an operational capacity of 594 plus 16 mental health bed. The superintendent reports that because of the mental health issues they are seeing, the practical capacity of this of mental health beds is actually half that amount. Current inmate count as of December 2020 is 918. Of those 918, 345 inmates are the responsibility of the state of Virginia's Department of Corrections. 237 of those 345 are at 90 days or greater past sentencing date and should be housed at state facilities. We anticipate these numbers will be reduced in a post-pandemic world once the state restarts to resume their suspension of inmate transfers. As a comparison, in February 2020, prior to the pandemic shutdown, state responsibility prisoners over 90 days past sentencing was 164 inmates or 74 inmates less than December's report. Under the uh, city staff developed alternative, operational capacity of the jail would increase from 610, including 16 mental health beds, to 946, including 64 mental health beds. Slide seven continues with additional factors considered. The effects of prison reform in the state of Virginia have yet to be seen. Impacts are expected to be on, on both the front and back end of sentencing. On the front end, expected increases in jury trials may lead to an increase in negotiations between Commonwealth attorneys' offices and defendants, which in turn may lead to lighter sentences and lowering the number of inmates at the Middle River Regional Jail. The impact of the front end changes have not been incorporated into Moses calculation could potentially surpass the back end reductions. On the back end, increased credit for proper behavior is expected to impact, impact the state inmate count and ultimately lower the number of inmates at the jail. Population estimates provided by Mosley account for the projected impact of increased earned, credit <laughs> increased earned behavior credits. Due to this factor alone, Mosley projects a 20% reduction in state responsible inmates of 42 inmates in year 2024, a year in which the firm has projected population range of 694 to 101 inmate, 1001 inmates. Our closing comments, the Middle River Regional Jail spent expansion project continues to evolve. The project started out with a scope which could have resulted in an annual increase to the city 
in as much as $2.2 million on an annual basis or the equivalent of 11 cents in real estate tax rate. The potential offer option presented by jail staff would result in an annual increase of 1.7 or the equivalent of eight and one quarter cents. Finally, the city developed alternative potentially reduces this further to 6.57 equivalency of real estate tax. Given the uncertainty of the effects of prison reform on inmate population, as well as a possible reduction of state responsible inmate counts as the pandemic subsides, we question the need for a more aggressive expansion at this time. We believe the option we have developed has the potential to adequately address the needs of the jail and member localities. In our view, decisions concerning a more robust expansion should be deferred until the effects of prison reform is able to produce a reliable trend. Savings could be used to support alternative in, in, in car, to incarceration uh, developed in concert with stakeholders in the area. Got that out. Yeah. Madam Mayor, Madam, um, be oh, before yes. you open it for, for questions, just very quickly, let, let me just try to distill this um, at its essence. Mr. Newton identified five key issues to be addressed by an expansion project. The renovation of the core elements of the facility, community corrections, mental health, increased minimum custody beds, and where, a warehouse and maintenance facility. We're on board with addressing all of those from a staff perspective. If you'll write th these numbers down that I'm going to sh share with you, Mr. Newton's um, potential option has 192 new minimum security beds, 112 community corrections beds, 48 mental health beds, and then renovations to the core and the additional maintenance and warehouse space. The only place that we differ in terms of the physical facility or the physical plant is the 112. And you know, Mr. Trayer and I are not jail administrators. And so I, I acknowledge that it may not be as simple as pulling out the 112 beds separate community corrections facility and, and assigning both uses to the 192 beds remaining. But in terms of cost of project, as he has presented it, it, it really is sort of focused around that 112 beds as well as additional operating costs that come um, with the potential option he has presented versus the option that Mr. Trayer has presented. And so with that, um, I would invite you to pose your questions to either Mr. Newton or Mr. Trayer. And Mayor. All right, Vice Mayor Robertson. Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Newton, maybe I can just ask, even if this can be answered, but I reckon my question is how many inmates in this facility are, are being sentenced by our Stanton court systems? And what is Stanton's, maybe I heard Phil do it, I, my figures will not fly, but how much is Stanton responsible? Did I hear 20% of, so we're, we're paying 20%. What is, what is our Stanton court system on a typical basis putting into that system. Your, your percentage is developed based on the number of inmates housed. So mm -hmm. your court system is producing about 20% of our population. Okay. So on an annual basis, we look at uh, the percentage of folks that are housed by each of our member jurisdictions. And that's the percentage that we use to fund the next year's fiscal year budget. Okay. Uh, Stanton has been pretty consistently about 20% for a number of years now. It hasn't shifted and shifted much up or down. We're um, basically paying what, what we put in. Correct. Okay. Okay. Madam Mayor. Councilman Claffey. If the state doesn't give their 25%, is this all a mute point? <clears throat> I mean, would, we're struggling well, to come up with, co with core money correct. with the state given 25%. If we don't get the 25% from the state, would it just do the project again? I don't think, I don't foresee any future for a project that's not included in the state budget. Statutorily, if a project's approved and it's included in the state budget, they have to fund it. 
Now, where they fund it from is they don't fund it from the state operating budget. They, they issue it with a bond when they go out, and, you know, VDOT goes out for bridges, you know, they, it's all borrowed money. Um, but this is how we have funded the regional jail network in the Commonwealth. You know, when we originally started the network uh, 25 years ago, the state was funding 50% because they wanted to incentivize local jurisdictions to close smaller uh, jails and get into regional jails so it's more economical to operate. Uh, three or four budget cycles ago, they changed the formula so it's now only 25% reimbursement. But if we're not included in the state project, if we're not included in the state budget, then I don't think there's any foreseeable future for a project this year. Any further questions? I do. Um, Council uh, Member Holmes. Mr. Treyer, what, what would this bring our payments up to uh, uh, if we were to go through with this? Um, it would, if, well, if we went with the um, Stanton option, it would go up uh, $1.7 million. So that would be uh, uh, 4.1 million. And then if we went uh, with, with the potential option, um, no, excuse me, um, that is a potential option. And if we were gonna go with the Stanton option, it would go up 1.3 million. So that would bring you up to 3.7. Can you go over that again? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, let me take this off. So we currently have an operating budget of $2.4 million. Um, the potential option would bring that up an additional 1.7 million. So, so that would bring you up to 4.1. And then the, the Stanton option, again, we start with the 2.4, and this is using FY21's budget. Uh, as, as we heard, FY22 is even more robust. Um, but using the FY21's budget, we had the 1.3 to that. So 2.4 plus 1.3, 3.7. Right. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any additional questions at this time? This is Brenda Mead. I have a question. Councilmember Mead. Mead. Oaks. Um, I, uh, going back to the community based corrections plan that was developed by Mosley. Were members of the community involved in that planning process in terms of advocacy and um, and uh, members of the uh, justice involved population? And could you can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, uh, going back to the development of the community based corrections plan, were any members of advocacy groups or just in justice involved communities involved with that, or was it simply a uh, a plan developed by an architectural firm? It was primarily a plan developed by the architectural firm, but we did presentations of the plan to both um, the uh, Harrisonburg Community Corrections Council and the Blue Ridge Community Corrections Council and solicited comments at those bodies. And in uh, a second question, a follow-up question, the, the population growth numbers seem to be higher than what, uh, what the general population growth numbers are. Is there a reason for that? No, that's one of the unusual things about that particular um, factor of the study. It's based on you know, what historical trends we're seeing and that's just what the numbers produced. Mm -hmm. We couldn't identify any particular reason why that. And, and, and that's not information that could be obtained from Mosley? No, we had that discussion with Mosley. Okay, and, and they couldn't answer that question? Correct. Oh. oh, okay, thank you. Any additional questions? Yes, this is Carolyn Dahl. Uh, I had asked this earlier in the week or last week or this whenever uh, about how how our percentage uh, of ownership of debt and operating expenses uh, was, was factored. And it's factored on, on the arrests. Not, not that these are Stanton citizens, not a percentage of that, but a percentage of arrests. And I thought that's kind of an interesting 
factor because, for example, if you wanted to go break into cars and steal stuff, you'd go where all the cars were. So if you, you know, if you lived in some other rural county or something, you'd come to Stanton to do that. So then when you get arrested, then we're being charged with your expense. I don't know how it would look if we went by where they actually lived. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at that, but it just seemed an odd way to divvy up the percentages. Is there any comment concerning um, Council Member Dole's um, question? Well, well, the percentage is based on use. Mm -hmm. So um, we're housing the individual and they were arrested by um, law enforcement agencies from Stanton. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, it's a use-based system. Um, you know, the individual could be from Culpeper and come here and commit the crime. There's no mechanism in place under for us to charge Culpeper for that person because the crime occurred here in Stanton. So it's not based on population, it's based on use. It's a utilization law. Okay, all right. Okay. Use space. Okay. Right. Thank Mayor you. Mayor Oaks, I have an additional question if I could. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Newton, uh, uh, are you fully staffed currently? We are not. About what percentage of full staffing are you at? We have about 30 vacancies. Uh, I would like to caution you that um, we received five emergency positions from the, the Compensation Board in July, another 18 in November. So 23 of my vacant positions are those positions we haven't been able to be filled primarily because recruitment during COVID has been very challenging for us. We have about 30 vacancies. Is that, is that uh, common in the, in the uh, criminal justice business? <laughs> it is a, there any shortages in staff? It is a common challenge that my contemporaries in all the regional jails across the Commonwealth are facing today. Everybody is struggling to recruit uh, entry-level jail officers. And what is your turnover? You know, I'm not prepared to answer that tonight, Ms. Mead. I'll, I'll, I'll get that number back to uh, Mr. Rosenberg. It, you don't have to tell me the exact number, just kind of a range, anything, any? It's, it's probably north of 20% at the front end. So we hire entry-level officers and that's generally where all of our turnover is. It's probably north of 20%. And so if, uh, I, I'm assuming that you're going to have to expand your staff in, in the event that there's a, an increase in beds. Yes. And are you confident that you would be able to staff and increase the, uh, a facility of that size? Yes. Because it will become easier to recruit because it would be an easier job to do? No, it's going to be the same job, but it's a good job. And, you know, we don't, ha we don't have to fill those vacant positions for three years. If we start building, if we do a project and we, we agree to begin design in July, we don't anticipate occupying any of those buildings, any of those new beds till December of 23. So we have got three full years to design a, a program and a recruitment program for recruitment of those new employees. So I'm, I'm very confident we'll be able to fill those positions. So going back to my earlier question about turnover, um, what, uh, what drives that level of turnover? I think there are two factors. I think um, we have a young workforce, and so they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. Two, we have folks that um, come into our ploy that decide they just don't like this kind of work, and so they leave. And then we have a smaller percentage of employees that come into our employment because they're using it as a stepping stone to law enforcement. So we, we lose a lot of folks to other law enforcement agencies because they want to be a law enforcement officer instead of a jail officer. That's not likely to change. It sounds like recruiting is something that's pretty oh. much a full-time mm -hmm. job for you. Yes, ma'am, it is. Mr. Rosenberg. Um, Madam Mayor, um, as we close, I just want to remind council members that as early as next week, 
Sheriff Robertson, Mr. Chair, and I may be asked to vote on a proposal at a meeting of the authority mm -hmm. board. So if any council members have any further questions or comments, um, we invite you to direct them to us uh, so that we can give them thoughtful consideration as we make our decisions as authority board members. If we don't have the answers to your questions, uh, we will turn to Mr. Newton to see whether he can provide those answers. It's Thank February you. 2nd. That's Tuesday. That, that's correct. And, and yes, that, that's the earliest date on which a vote would occur. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Trayer and uh, Sheriff Robertson, uh, Mr. Rosenberg. All right. Uh, with that, we are we are finished with the work session and we are now on break and we'll return for the regular meeting at 730. As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamed live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Ms. Mead. Here. I've confirmed that all council members are present. Thank you. I ask that City Manager Steve Rosenberg note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, participating on the Zoom platform this evening are Faith Simmons, Clerk of Council, Council members Carolyn Dole and Brenda Mead, and Jessica Lurz with Mullen, Mullen and Lonergan Associates, the city's consultant on the uh, Community Development Block Grant Program. All right, thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of City Council. In addition to limited public seating in City Hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During public hearings towards the beginning of the meeting and matters from the public on council's agenda towards the end of the meeting, public comments will be taken in person and by telephone. Members of the public who wish to participate in such matters by telephone at the appropriate time may call 844-854 2222 and when prompted enter the access code 619358 hashtag callers will be recognized in order the public is reminded that public hearings and matters from the public is a time for council simply to listen to your comments each speaker will be limited to five minutes detailed instructions for public participation by telephone have been publicized over the course of the past week on the city's website and facebook page and can be found now on the agenda for this meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city dash council also let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting although being conducted in person is also being conducted by zoom with virtual participation of certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the city council ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04 as extended by City Council Ordinance number 2021-04. All right. I need a drink of water, excuse me. Okay, with all of that said, I would like to uh, remind everyone, if you come into the city council uh, chambers or anywhere in city hall, if you can please wear your mask. Um, we do offer hand sanitizer 
the um, both entrances of um, the chambers. We also have sanitizing wipes at the podium. If you wish to speak um, at the podium, feel free to use the sanitizing wipes. Also, I would like to remind the council members, if you would like to be recognized, please recognize the mayor and I will recognize you. And with that, our next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would care to, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and for all. Okay, our next item is an invocation moment of silence, and tonight it will be Council Member Brenda Mead. Thank you. Speaking two years after California's Watts riots in August 1965 and race riots in Harlem the previous summer. Martin Luther King spent a few minutes trying to explain the cause of rioting to his predominantly white audience. America has consistently taken a positive step toward on the question, forward on the question of racial justice and racial equality, only to follow it with certain backward steps, King said. Because of widespread and widely ignored black poverty and racial injustice, all of our cities are potentially powder kegs, he added and many in moments of anger, many in moments of deep bitterness engage in riots, King continued. Let me say, as I've always said, and I will always continue to say, that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so, in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the mayor's report. And I would mm -hmm. like to report that um, I attended the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. It's called the Air, a GAIR program. Um, this was a GAIR introduction seminar it was very informative. Uh, I uh, not only attended this particular seminar, but so did our city manager, Steve Rosenberg, as well as our ass assistant city manager, Leslie Beauregard. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, would you like to um, discuss more about the GARE program? Uh, certainly, Madam Mayor. Um, and as the mayor mentioned, uh, GARE is the acronym for the name of a nonprofit organization, the Local and Regional Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And the organization is a national network of government working to achieve racial equity and advance opportunities for all. As Mayor Oaks mentioned, Ms. Beauregard and I um, have also participated recently in one of GARE's virtual informational sessions. Since participating in that session, I've also subsequently followed up with GARE staff to obtain detailed information about what they call GARE Foundations, which is the organization's introductory program, and I'll quote here, to provide foundational concepts in racial equity to members to meet the needs of jurisdictions new to this work and to provide opportunities for members to practice using a racial equity analysis. <clears throat> Ms. Beauregard and I will learn more about GARE and specifically about the experiences of other Virginia localities, including Richmond, Norfolk, Manassas, Alexandria, and the counties of Fairfax and Prince William, all of which are members of GARE. Uh, and we'll learn, 
learn more about their experiences in the GARE program when we virtually attend our professional association's winter conference next month. My intention, consistent with my discussions with Mayor Oaks, is to more fully brief council after we attend the conference next month and at that time to seek council's guidance concerning the city's possible membership in GARE and participation in particular in the GARE Foundation's program as a first step. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, the next item is uh, additional items by members of council. Are Madam, there any additional items? Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a couple statements. Um, I would like to first probably make a comment uh, to my fellow council member, Ms. Mead, and several of her uh, Facebook friends um, that have uh, made some really nice comments uh, online. Um, I would say to Ms. Mead that um, I don't know why um, you decided to take the comment down. I reckon my, my statement on that would be if you didn't mean to say it, why did you? And if you did mean to say it, why didn't you have enough nerve to leave it up? Having said that, I would like to read a statement and I will admit that I have typed it out so that I make sure that I get every word right. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to address a recent Stanton News Leader article about the vice mayor receiving both doses of COVID-19 vaccine days before other area pharmacists and pharmacies had gotten their first dose. It is unfortunate that the article left out pertinent information about my specific situation. The incorrect report tried to say Augusta Health was supplying vaccine to an affiliated <coughs> pharmacy, referencing, referencing Fishersville Family Pharmacy. Nothing, I repeat nothing, could be further from the truth. They are an independent pharmacy and have nothing to do with the hospital. I do work there part-time, but I also work, and very proudly so, for Augusta Health's outpatient pharmacy. That is where I received my doses, just like the other hospital employees, so that we can continue to serve and supply the medical needs of our community. Coming after me is part of the job. I understand that. But the other misfortune is that the Virginia Department of Health and the Central Shenandoah Health District were left trying to explain why someone got the vaccine out of order. This should have never, ever happened. Jumping to conclusions and making rash statements without all the facts is never a good idea. I can assure you, I will continue working to support getting the vaccine to our community as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention. I'd like this entered into the record as print. Are there any additional comments by members of council? Yeah. Hey Rokes, this is Brenda Mead. Council member Mead. Thank you. This morning I attended the VML uh, legislative update um, in past years, uh, we have all, uh, or most of us anyway, have um, driven to Richmond uh, to attend this uh, legislative update meeting. Uh, in this case, it was um, via the Zoom platform and it was done very effectively. Um, the governor spoke. Uh, he spoke about his budget priorities for the coming year um, uh, that, uh, and, and, uh, we got a finance update uh, from Jim Reginball, uh, talked about Virginia's unemployment rate being down to 4.9%. Uh, 
may be a little misleading because uh, so many people have dropped out of the workforce, um, but, uh, but acknowledged that that was a positive. The um, uh, hospitality and entertainment is the largest segment of the unemployment. They're the hardest hit segment. Uh, local government next and health and education, all of those segments have been hit uh, during COVID. Um, the bright spot was that sales taxes for the state as a whole have been much better uh, due, a, due to a 40% increase in internet sales during the pandemic. Um, uh, the, they continue to expect um, an increase in, in sales taxes and they expect to see an increase in the state budget, uh, state revenues up 3% for fiscal year 21 and expecting a spring back in fiscal year 22. Um, he noted that, Mr. Regenball noted that over 70% of the stimulus money went to pay down debt and went into savings. And so it's expected that the pent up opportunities to spend will, uh, will, bring, will make fiscal 22 uh, a good year for the state. Uh, we're still um, we estimated that residential real estate values will, be, will go up uh, and therefore um, uh, property tax revenues will increase at local levels, um, but still a uh, 4% 4, 4 decline for local budgets across the state is anticipated for the next year. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Holmes. Uh, yes, I'm, I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, I've been on council for six and a half years. And during that whole time, uh, uh, Doug Gwynn has been our attorney. And, and Doug has served the city and the school board and economic development board with distinction, I think. And I think he is just, I'm gonna miss him, you know, and I just like to, to tell him that and, uh, and I hope he does well wherever he ends up. But anyway, I just think we should need to appreciate him a little bit. Thank you for that. I was not going to say anything because uh, Mr. Gwen, um, I guess you were being shy about it, Mr. Gwen, um, with the recognition, but uh, thank you, Council Member Holmes. Um, Mr. Gwen, you have been, um, you have been just such an asset to the city and to the city council, and we appreciate um, your many, many hours of service to the Stanton City Council and it's obvious you love Stanton and you just truly want to make Stanton uh, the best place it can be. And so thank you so very much for all of the, um, well, not only the service, but the, uh, the, the tears that we probably have brought to you. Uh, you've been very patient with us. And so thank you uh, for everything that you have done for this council and for the city. Are there any additional comments by members of council? Mayor, yes, this is Carolyn Dahl. Um, council member Darby. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to recognize and, and thank Stanton City Public Schools because since we last met, they have been uh, able to uh, get back into a uh, hybrid uh, virtual learning environment, uh, hybrid for those students who wish to attend. And it's, it's been really, really well from what I understand. And, and so I think, you know, commend them on their efforts. Council, Council Member Carolyn Dole. Yes, thanks. I'd like to extend my best wishes to Doug Gwynn as well. He has been um, uh, just a, a, the quintessential uh, attorney of integrity and intelligence. A, a combination, good combination to have, and I know he will be uh, keep himself busy uh, in the in the legal field, and we wish him the best. And I can say that I'm saying that never having tried to stab you in the back. So also, I attended the virtual meeting of the uh, re, uh, uh, Shenandoah. Valley uh, Regional Tourism uh, and 
a little few interesting things is that Shandor National Park has experienced record-breaking attendance during this COVID time, which makes sense when you think about it. And also uh, an interesting statistic is that uh, each citizen pays less uh, in state and local taxes each year because of tourism and the amount less that they pay in state and local taxes for each citizen is $573. So tourism is truly an asset. I also attended the historic Stanton Foundation annual meeting uh, and they had the uh, awards. So I'll just announce the residential award was won by Chip and Ray Milborn. The Residential Special Project Award was won by Larry and Diane Raglan. The Commercial Rehab product, uh, Project was uh, awarded to the Stanton Innovation Hub, Peter and Allison Denby. Another Commercial Rehab Award went to uh, Blackburn Inn, a conference center and spa. And finally, the Heritage Preservation Award was given to, of course, Robin Miller and Village Development Associates. They've done a wonderful job in renovating our historic buildings. Uh, and finally, uh, as, like Ms. Mead, I also attended the uh, Virginia Municipal League and I think uh, Leslie Beauregard was there as well. I didn't see anybody else. Um, and so Brenda has covered all the financial data pretty well, but I will point out that uh, Virginia, in terms of vaccination rate, has moved up to be ranked 28th out of the states as of today. Thank you. All right, moving on to the regular meeting. Uh, item A is the consent agenda. All items will be voted on in one motion, if so requested by any member of council, an item placed on the consent agenda shall be removed and taken up as a separate matter. So if any council member would like to discuss um, A1 or A2, uh, we'll just add that to the bottom of the agenda. This if, is, yes. This is Carolyn Dahl. I would like to remove both of them from the consent agenda because they are both in fact, grant applications and grants. And because we, uh, we voted to change one of our council memoranda to uh, ensure transparency with uh, potential revenues, uh, I think, you know, to, to follow along with uh, that procedure, we should be discussing these separately. All right. Um, um, council member Dole, I think that's, um, a great idea. I think we should discuss both of them separately. The consent agenda is just something new that we are trying out. Um, the city council has not had a consent agenda uh, for as long as I've been on city council. So um, each item is uh, certainly worthwhile in its discussion. So A1 will now become item number F and A2 will become item number G. So in that case, we will move on to item B, a discussion, public hearing, and consideration of ordinance authorizing a third extension of a five-year lease agreement with new singular wireless PCS LLC for wireless communications equipment. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Jeff Johnston, the city director of public works will present this item. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. It's great to be here. Um, since December of 2005, the city has leased space atop our water tower up at the water treatment plant to, uh, to who is new now, New Cellular Wireless. Uh, it's an AT&T affiliated uh, firm. Uh, that lease had, had an initial five-year term. It's been extended twice, and we have negotiated a third extension uh, with the firm. Uh, so council would like to... Uh, uh, Consider that and hold the whole public hearing. Uh, we are standing by to execute the amendment if need be. All right. Are there any questions by council members? All right. Well, hearing none, I will bang the gavel to open up the public hearing. Anyone that would like to speak for or against 
um, please come to the podium or you may call in. Um, once I close the public hearing out, I'll bang the gavel and then I'll entertain a motion from a council member. So with that, the public hearing is now open. Would anyone like to address the council for or against? Mr. Rosenberg, do we have any callers? So we have uh, three callers on the line, Madam Mayor. We can evaluate whether they're calling uh, for the public hearing on the lease renewal or for just matters from the public um, and try to sift through them. Okay. Looks like maybe we have two callers now. Okay. Do you want to ask them if it's yeah. uh, for the public hearing? The caller whose number ends in four seven. Are you on the line? Hello. Okay. Let's skip to the next. Yeah, call. let's go to the next. The caller whose number ends in one seven. Are you on the line? Yes, I'm online. All right. Can you tell me, are you calling about the public hearing on the lease extension or to speak during matters from the public? No, I'm calling on, I'm actually calling on the lease extension, actually. You are calling on the lease extension? Great. That's, that's correct. No. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. So, um, name is Victor A. Meyer. Nine zero three North Augusta Street, Stanton two four four zero one. And just wanted to state for the record that I've heard the hearings and would register my objection to the proceedings. Okay, all right. Did you care to say anything else? Nope. All right, well, thank you. Any additional callers, Mr. Rosenberg? Yeah. All right. Would anyone else like to speak? Hearing none, the public hearing is now closed. I'll entertain a motion concerning the five-year lease agreement. Mayor Oaks. Council Member Holmes. I move that the city council adopt an ordinance authorizing the execution of the third amend amendment to lease agreement, extending the term of the existing lease with new cellular wireless PCS LLC for an additional five years. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Like Council Member Clappy. I'd like to second it. All right, so we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Clappy. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oak. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next item is item C, a discussion and consideration of substantial amendment to the FY 2019 annual action plan to allocate additional U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development CDBG-CB funds awarded under the FY 2020 CARES Act and amend the FY 2019 annual plan to reallocate CDBG funds Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I previously shared with you that Jessica Lurz with, uh, uh, with the consulting firm assisting the city, uh, Mullen and Lonergan Associates uh, was joining us on Zoom. I can see now that she's been joined by her colleague, Kate Molinaro. I'm pinch hitting on this this evening for Mr. Vaughn who was unexpectedly unable to join us. Um, and so I understand that uh, 
the, the folks with Mullen and Lonergan Associates are equipped to carry the laboring or on this one. And so I'll just go ahead and turn it over to them, noting that there is action for council to consider after they have completed their presentation. All right, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to see all of you again. Thank you for having us. Um, so as the city manager mentioned, HUD has allocated their second sum of CARES Act funding under the Community Development Block Grant. This allocation is for an additional $125,726, making a total allocation to the city of Stanton for $332,726. This is to provide eligible activities to low and moderate income persons in the community, which will prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Agencies who received funds during the first allocation were all contacted again uh, to see if there were any need for additional resources. All but one of those agencies stated that they needed additional funds. So the city of Stanton is proposing that those agencies receive those additional funds. The Salvation Army would receive additional funding for a homeless prevention program and for their food distribution program. Blue Ridge Legal Services would be receiving additional funds to provide legal services to households and persons who are at risk of homelessness due to eviction. Valley Mission, would be providing additional funds to provide case management services to households who are experiencing homelessness and in the emergency shelter. The Central Shenandoah Health District received additional dollars to provide education and resources on COVID to underserved areas in the city of Stanton. Stanton will also use a small allocation of additional administrative funds to continue to provide oversight and technical assistance to subgrantees for these programs. The substantial amendment is also um, looking to have a change from the 2019 approved consolidated plan. Uh, the Valley Supportive Housing uh, Program is in desperate need of a roof replacement. And in the 2019 program, Valley Supportive Housing was allocated $20,000 to uh, purchase, the, purchase a new home to provide permanent supportive housing. Unfortunately, that home was unable to be purchased with federal dollars due to being in a floodplain. Since Valley Mission needs this roof replacement on a property that they currently own, the city is proposing to reallocate those original funds to the new roof project and give them an additional $10,000 from that to complete the full repair of the roof. To accommodate that increase in funding, the city proposes a reduction in the Rockway Street Line project. However, this project is a multi-year project and will be completed with future funding. So to accommodate that reduction, we would be increasing future funding years so that both can be fully funded. Those are all of the substantial amendments and um, presentation for you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions by council members? Councilmember Holmes? No? Okay. <laughs> Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor Robertson. You ready for the motion? Yeah. Uh, I move that City Council approve the substantial amendment to the fiscal, fiscal year 2019 annual action plan for CARES Act CDBG CV funds in response to the COVID 19 emergency and the reallocation of fiscal year 2019 CDBG project funds and authorize the city manager to execute appropriate forms, including sub-recipient agreements with agencies recommended to receive HUD CDBG CV funds. All right, so we have a motion by Vice Mayor Robertson. Do we have a second? Madam Mayor, I'll second that. All right, that's um, Council Member Amy Darby has second. Any further discussion? I'm hearing this is Carol Carolyn and Dole. Yeah. Carolyn Dole? Uh, I, even though I don't have a conflict of interest, to avoid the appearance of impropriety, I will be abstaining on this. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. 
Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. And thank you for joining us and everything you do for our community. Thank you. Next item is item D, a presentation of the quarterly financial report. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Phil Treyer, the city's chief finance officer, will present this item. Welcome back, Mr. Treyer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's a pleasure to be back. Long time no see. <laughs> Tonight we are moment. here to report FY21 second quarter unaudited postings and revenues and expenses. Year-to-date revenues posted through December 31st, 2020, total 29 million 24,000 or 43.8% of the annual appropriation. In FY 2020, through the second quarter, posted revenues was 24,725, or 41.1% of the annual appropriation. Even though we are 50% through the fiscal year, 43.8 is a little above average, given the normal timing of major revenue sources, such as real estate taxes, which have historically skewed these percentages. In addition, COVID, COVID revenues received by the city have been appropriated and posted, which have also skewed dollar and percentage variances. Local taxes of interest sales tax is slightly up over last year by $2,400, uh, but that's $500,000 over our forecasted budget. Meals tax is down 167,000, about 8% over same time last year, but we're $279,000 ahead of forecasted budget. Lodging revenue is down 183,000 over same time last year, $86,000 below forecasted budget, and that's about a 38% decrease. <clears throat> On the expense side, we have posted 27,062,000 or 42.3% of the annual appropriation. From a percentage basis, this is fairly consistent with prior year expenditures as the end of the second quarter 2020, we had expensed 24 million 413,000 or 42.4% of the annual appropriation. On a dollar basis, we are looking at an additional $2.6 million over FY 2020. And this variance is directly contributed to the CARES Act funding. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. <clears throat> are there any questions for Mr. Treyer? All right. So we do not need a vote on this. It was a uh, just simply a presentation. So thank you, Mr. Traer. Thank you. All right, moving on to item E, a discussion and consideration of an uncodified emergency ordinance regarding additional conditions for use of electronic communications in meetings of city public bodies. All right, Matt, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, at your last meeting, council will recall adopting an ordinance to extend the continuity of government provisions, mm -hmm. uh, which expired earlier this month. And the ordinance was adopted by council to extend those provisions through April 9th, mm -hmm. 2021. As a part of your discussions uh, related to that ordinance, there were some additional issues raised by council members uh, to address um, the use of video on the Zoom platform, as well as council member uh, access using electronic communications to meetings of the nominations committee. And so uh, we had, working with the city attorney's office, prepared an ordinance to address those two issues, and it is before you this evening. Madam. All right. Madam um, Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Uh, this is where I tried to insert the yeah. first one. I, yeah. I think at this time, I would like to make a motion that we simply postpone uh, discussion of this, uh, this part of it, uh, part of the meeting until the following, until our February the 11th meeting, right. simply because there has been, and our chairman can speak to this, we have not had the ability to have a nominations committee meeting yet. Our, our meeting is scheduled for uh, February 2nd. So therefore at that time, we'll be able to have a discussion, determine what we intend to do. Okay, so Vice Mayor Robertson, you have a, a motion stating you would like to table this issue until the next meeting. To the February 11th meeting. The February 11th Mr. meeting uh, for 2021. All right, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I'd like to second that. Okay. 
Um, Councilman Clathy has seconded. Any further discussion? Mayor Oaks, this is Councilwoman Mead. Councilwoman Mead. Uh, since the meeting will take place prior to this authorization of my attending or any member of the council other than the members of the nominations committee, I'd like to ask that I be permitted to attend this meeting that's coming up on, for, on February 2nd. Since I actually have a right under FOIA to attend, um, it's simply a, a courtesy that I'm asking for. And so I would like to attend. Would you like to give an, an answer or, or would you want to discuss it? If it's available, we can do this. I mean, it hasn't been figured yet. Yeah, I mean, are you plan on, I'm sorry, no, no, you, no. you plan on attending in person and? No, I plan on attending on the Zoom platform. I think that's the discussion that's that the they're discussion going to have on have. Tuesday. And that was uh, Vice Mayor Robertson that just I'm spoke. sorry, I'm sorry. It, it really is just a courtesy. Yeah. Let's have the discussion. Hmm? Let's have the discussion at the February 2nd meeting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we had planned on doing this meeting. We were going to have our discussion on February 2nd, make a decision as to whether we were going to allow Zoom platform uh, for, for you or, and, then, and then report back to council, and then we could go, uh, and go from there. I mean, that's our, that's our time. We had planned on having this done, I believe, but unfortunately just situations arose where we were not able to get everybody together. Uh, we couldn't have our clerk of council with us just and, and that's the reason the meeting had to be postponed. So that's why we're uh, planning on having or postponing the, the, the actual council discussion of, of that platform come February 11th. And will there be interviews scheduled on, uh, on the day of your meeting? Uh, yes, I believe Faith has set up some interviews. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Ms. Simmons, you're on mute. Mayor Oates. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. No. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Stoll. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carry. Aye. All right. That takes us to item F, which um, is the application for FY 2020 assistance to firefighters grant. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Scott Garber, the city's fire chief will present this item. Welcome fire chief, Scott Garber. Good evening, Good evening Madam Mayor, members of the council. Thank you for having me here. Uh, tonight before you have, a, we have a application um, request for an assistance to firefighters grant uh, for the total of $45,000 where our, um, our percentage of that is a 10% match for $4,500. And this funding would be used to keep our thermal imaging camera program up to date and moving forward. I'd be happy to take any questions anyone may have. Scott, I'm sorry. Oh, um, Vice Mayor Roberts, sorry. Uh, Chief uh, Mark, uh, tell me again, I'm assuming I saw some of the pictures. Tell me exactly what this, this piece of equipment does. It allows you. Yeah, so a thermal imaging camera allows our personnel inside a smoke-filled building or where they have zero visibility to be able to pick up objects of heat uh, to include a victim, um, <coughs> uh, hidden fire within a wall, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very uh, radical or I wouldn't say radical, but very up-to-date uh, thermal imaging camera program. We're one of the few departments in the Commonwealth that every single one of our firefighters is equipped with this equipment. Um, most departments may only have one per piece of apparatus, but we have at least four. Okay. And how many do we get for the $45,000? $45,000 will buy us about five of those. That was Councilman Claffey that asked the question. Uh, any additional questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Council Member Amy Darby. I move that City Council authorize staff to apply for an assistance to firefighters grant 
for the purpose of acquiring thermal imaging cameras as proposed provided matching funds are available in the fire and rescue department budget for this purpose. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam uh, Mayor. Council Member Claffey. I'd like to second that. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. So the next item is item G, an application for Virginia Economic Development Partnership Grant through the Virginia Brownsfield Restoration and Economic Redevelopment Assistance Fund for the Arcadia Project. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. The, this item is on the agenda um, for your consideration and authorization of a grant application by the city for a DBAF grant, not to repeat the mouthful that, that the mayor just shared with you all. Um, and, and the purpose of the grant is to support uh, the restoration and redevelopment of what is known as the Arcadia Project on East Beverly Street. Um, the, the grants are available in amounts up to $50,000 and they're available to assist with various costs, including environmental and cultural resource site assessments, development of remediation and reuse plans, um, and uh, the demolition and removal of existing structures or other site work necessary to make a site or certain real property usable for new economic development. I should hasten to add that there's no demolition involved with this project. Uh, staff is requesting that the city uh, submit an application on behalf of the Arcadia project to the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, which administers this grant program. Um, there is a dollar for dollar match that is required. However, the Arcadia project will provide that match. In fact, they will exceed the match. Uh, by almost two times um, using previously expended funds um, that were received uh, from a different grant program. A resolution of support is required by the city. It's included in your agenda package. Uh, and um, though there is no direct cash match required by the city, there will be some requisite staff time um, for grant administration, monitoring and reporting. Um, Ms. Pamela Wagner, who's the executive director of the Arcadia Project, is on the Zoom platform with us now. And if you have any questions of her, I am sure that she's happy to answer them. Are there any questions? Would you like to make any comments? All right. Well, I would like to say that um, I'm very excited for the Arcadia. I think this is... Um, a push in the right direction. Um, I um, really hope that this uh, comes through. Fingers crossed. All right. Any additional comments? Motion. All right. Council Member Clappy. Madam Mayor, I move to adopt the resolution approving an application by the City of Stanton, Virginia, to the Virginia Economic Development Partnership for Virginia Brownfields Restoration and Economic Development Assistance Fund Remediation Grant to fund the Arcadia project as presented and to authorize the city manager or his designee to complete any actions necessary in connection with such a grant. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Holmes. I second the motion. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Well, I think that was worthwhile. Um, instead of voting on that under the consent agenda, I think it was worthwhile um, having the breakdown. Again, I'm very excited for the Arcadia. All right, with that, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Stoll. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. That takes us to matters from the city manager, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Madam Mayor, I have one item um, before
before I share the item with council, I'll remind the public that the next item is matters from the public. And if you wish to participate by telephone, now would be the time to call to place yourself in the queue. The number is 844-854-2222. And when prompted, enter the access code for the meeting, which is 619-358-POUND. The one item that I have for council members is um, to call to your attention a revised budget schedule. Uh, members of council present chambers have hard copies of this at their place. Um, Ms. Mead and Ms. Dole, it was emailed to you earlier this afternoon, along with all other council members. Um, coming off of the discussion about the jail expansion project, um, you, you get a sense of where we are in terms of timing with that. And you also get a sense in terms of the effect on the city's fiscal picture uh, looking forward. And especially given the timing, we felt that it was appropriate to adjust the, the budget schedule um, for development of the FY 2022 budget. And so essentially, once you get to the meetings, um, especially once you get to the, the meetings in March and April, mm -hmm. everything is shifted um, one meeting cycle okay. to make it later. And that's because we don't expect to have a complete picture of the jail authority budget um, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner that would have supported the prior schedule. Okay. So, so we pushed everything uh, one meeting cycle. I will call to your attention that the budget work session on April 15th does not start at 5 p.m. What? It starts at 7.30 p.m. Yeah. And the reason is that on the same night, there's a planning commission meeting in council chambers at 5.30. And in prior non-COVID years, we've been able to have a planning commission meeting in mm -hmm. council chambers and a council work session in the caucus room simultaneously, but we can't do that in the current environment. Right. So the work session regrettably We'll begin that evening at 7.30 p.m. I'd invite each of you to take a look at this and if it causes you any problems, please send an email to Ms. Beauregard or me. Uh, and I see the vice mayor has I just it. want to make sure I heard it. 8th to 22nd of April, yeah. you said? No, the 15th of okay. April. Which isn't a normal council meeting, correct? It is, that a it is not. Yeah. So that's the interim week. Right, yeah. So all it is is a budget work session. That's correct. E exactly, yes. And in past years where we had a budget work session during an intervening week, we would start it at, at 5 p.m., gotcha. but we can't do that because of the planning commission meeting in this room at the same time. Yeah. Well, we can all work together. So, so please, if you have any issues with this revised schedule, let us hear from you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you. The next item is matters from the public. Um, if you would like to come to the podium to speak or call in through Zoom, you have five minutes. Please state your name, your address, and um, you can go ahead and uh, say your remarks to the city council. I would ask everyone to um, please um, be polite in your comments which I'm sure you will. I just want to make sure that um, we do not have any council members that are singled out. And well, I please just refrain from um, calling any council members names. Um, if we can show respect to the chambers, that would be appreciated. All right, um, Mr. Rosenberg, let's start with the Zoom calls. All right, uh, it looks like we have several. Okay. Is the caller whose number ends in four seven on the line? Yes, uh, Paul and Benning is three three two Sharon Lane Stanton. Um, I'm calling about the news media ran an article in Sunday's paper about the mayor and some of the city council members. The article was wrong. The mayor and the other city council members mentioned 
He said, refused to reject the violence at the front of the Capitol. This is not true. I was there at that meeting. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a little bit about the newspaper. A past council member, Opie Carr, who happens to be black, was put on the front page of the paper, and his son was arrested for drugs. Council, choir, uh, council um, member was not mentioned in the article, or well, the council member was mentioned in the article. And then the council member, Brenda Mead, a white woman, whose son murdered a man, brutally murdered a man, was not mentioned. And uh, he, this man had three small children. And uh, this, tip, this tells me our newspaper is racist and it is true, and this should prove it. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Is the item, is the caller whose number ends in 2 4 on the line? Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Council. I hope you are all doing well. My name is Joshua Henson. I am a sophomore at Mary Baldwin. I live in the Tullidge Dormitory. Uh, I am um, calling into the meeting tonight to bring a matter on campus to your attention. Um, I'm calling on behalf um, of a fellow student, a sophomore by the name of Lurio Bachi. Um, Lurio is a South African exchange student at Mary Baldwin. Um, and recently, um, he is being faced with losing his scholarship. Um, he was granted um, scholarships by an organization known as studytrust.org. And due to COVID um, and, and monetary losses that were sustained as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this funding has been revoked. Um, I was just calling um, to draw attention to this issue because it, our attempt to make contact with the financial office and the office of the president at Mary Baldwin um, have been met with an insistence that nothing can be done. However, um, at the GoFundMe, the, the students have created a GoFundMe, uh, and we have raised over $9,000 in just three days, um, which is just under a quarter of what he will need in order to continue his education. Um, and I believe that there may be a number of other callers who will be calling to discuss the same issue as is important to many of us. Uh, and I just wanted to bring the attention to that. I'm going to provide the link now uh, in just a moment. My apologies. Um, the link is gofund.me slash 5380-4B28 um, if anyone is willing to assist in this effort, it would be greatly appreciated. Many um, students at Mary Baldwin are very passionate about this issue, uh, and we are standing together with Lee in his efforts to continue his education. Um, thank you very much, members of council. I cede the rest of my time. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in one seven on the line? Is the caller whose number ends in one seven on the line? Is the caller whose number ends in four three on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comment to council. Thank you. This is Jim Harrington. I reside at 116 William Street in Stanton. And good evening, Mayor and members of council. I'm, I called in tonight to note the departure of uh, Mr. Doug Gwynn as city attorney and to thank him for his many years of extraordinary service to our wonderful city. In my 10 years of service as a member of, that, of this council, and prior to that, in my nine years of service on the Stanton City School Board, I had the privilege of serving alongside Doug as we did the work of the city. These years brought numerous complicated and challenging issues to be resolved, as all years do in this line of work. In every issue, every challenge, I was personally grateful for Mr. Gwynn's steadfast guidance 
encyclopedic knowledge of applicable law and wise articulate counsel, all rooted in his reverence for the law and in his manifest devotion to the best interests of the city, its employees, and the citizens it serves. Doug, your professional colleagueship, and just as important, your personal friendship, have been a gift to me over the years, and they've both helped me to be a better public servant in the roles that I've pursued on behalf of our city and our schools. You're smart, honest, and hardworking, and the scope of your intellect and of your devotion to our work together has been a key element in the stunning progress we've achieved in making Stanton the magical place that it is. I'm proud of you and proud to be your friend, and I wish you all the best success in your future. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 5-3 on the line? Yes, I am. Hi, um, my name is Hannah Whitmer, and I uh, wanted to speak on the proposed expansion of Middle River Jail. I appreciated the opportunity to speak this week with uh, Council Member Dole and, and Mayor Oaks, and I um, appreciated taking part in the, the webinars that you held, Council Member Mead. Uh, a couple of evenings ago, and council members Classy and Holmes, I, I hope we can find a time next week to meet um, Vice Mayor Robertson and, and council member Darby. I did reach out to you earlier this week and would welcome an opportunity to speak with you as well about these concerns. I have um, three particular concerns that I wanted to share about the jail. I'm, um, first of all, very concerned about the racial disparities within our jail, 6% of the residents of our community are black and 22% of the inmates at Middle River Regional Jail are black. And you know, they say, if you build it, you fill it in terms of a jail. And unless you address the underlying reasons for that enormous racial disparity, you are going to once again fill it disproportionately with black people and people of color, and you're just going to grow and expand that racial injustice. Um, secondly, I am concerned about just the sheer impact that incarceration has on people. Jail, in this whole conversation, it seems like it's being framed as the solution to the problem of overcrowding. It's like a bigger jail is the solution. Um, but I think there's a very strong argument that, in fact, jail is a problem and it should be minimized at all costs. Uh, just two days being in jail has been statistically proven to increase somebody's likelihood of having a deeper commitment within the criminal justice system. Uh, you get arrested, you don't make it to work the next day, you lose your job the day after that. Um, that is harmful to people, that is harmful to our communities. 70 or 80 percent of people in jail uh, are parents. Having a parent that is incarcerated is shown to have significant and lasting impacts on children. Um, I know there's been discussion about um, you know, health concerns, and um, jail is an incredibly stressful environment and um, has even been shown to cause or worsen mental health conditions. And so treatment for mental health uh, conditions is best done outside of the jail, and we should absolutely be reducing the number of people in jail for all of these reasons. Um, my third concern, um, just in terms of sheer um, spending money on something that is not necessary, if you think about the scale and scope of this investment even you know, the $40 million plus debt plus operational cost is a permanent investment that we would be making. And I think it's very fair to ask before making that kind of investment, uh, is this really necessary? And um, I think there's a very strong argument that it is not and that we have not exhausted the potential for looking at more cost-effective ways of addressing public safety, and there's a few reasons I'm convinced of that. Uh, we have a extremely high number of beds right now 
for our population. If you look at the two jails, Middle River and Harrisonburg Rockingham, um, is over 1,200 jail beds for 250,000 people, which means we basically have right now, without any extension, we have the ability to incarcerate people at a rate that is more than double the national average incarceration rate for local jails. And it's not because our crime rates are double the national average. This, we are not a, a high crime community. Uh, the other reason I feel very confident that we have not exhausted all alternatives is a statement that was made by Major Eric Young uh, at Tuesday's webinar from the, the Middle River Jail. He stated over the past 10 months, everybody's worked very diligently to relieve the pressure due to COVID. We saw a reduction of 200 inmates from April to July of 2020. And to me, that is just such an obvious statement and it is the obvious question, why can't, if we can work diligently to re reduce our population in jail by 200 people for a few months, why can't we work diligently to reduce our jail population all of the time? Ms. Whitmer, um, your time is So good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 6-1 on the line? Uh, yeah. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Yeah, I have a couple of, account, uh, couple of comments to make. My name is Dave Copper. I live at 1603 Ridgeway Drive in, um, in Stanton. I want to thank uh, Mayor uh, and, and the council for their obviously hard work. Um, and I only have one complaint tonight. And I, I wish the, uh, the council members and uh, you know, the staff be cognizant of the People, uh, you know, that are a little older and they're a little bit of hard of hearing, uh, the sound system breaks up pretty regularly. I would like to see that addressed. I, I would like to thank the previous speaker for her facts and and figures for for the jail and the prison, well, the jail. Um, you know, it seems the uh, numbers have been cons consistently going up in the existing facility to the point of overcrowding, uh, as it's been stated. Um, personally, I, I would like the council to vote not in favor of, of the expansion. I, I believe the uh, numbers of arrests, the numbers of convictions uh, are trending down. Um, and and I, I would like to reiterate one of the facts the previous spoke, speaker spoke about was that uh, during this, this virus, this uh, COVID, that only 200 were allowed to go out on their own recognizance with, you know, ankle bracelets or whatever tracking devices that were available. Um, you know, with the rampant uh, infection rate in that jail, uh, I believe that, you know, the the early release rate or the release rate should have been much, much higher. And um, uh, again, I, I reiterate that the um, expansion should be uh, not voted yay on. And the other um, topic I, I would like to bring up, if I may, and I, I'm sorry if I hurt somebody's feelings, but what in God's name were you people thinking when you went to Washington on January 6th? We did I know you have we did not go to Washington. We did not go. Not a, not a single one of us went, sir. None of us went. Oh, none of us went. No, sir. Okay. Well, I, I withdraw my uh, comment then. None of us went. Hmm. No one on that camera is, freaking amazing you're yes, out of sir. order you're all out of order thank yes, you <laughs> thank you all right mr rosenberg
Is the caller whose number ends in zero two on the line? Hello? Is the caller whose number ends in one one on the line? Yes, sorry, I am. Um, I think they'll try to call me out because I'm like seven really. Um my name is Joshua Rose. I live at 1707 North Drive in Stanton, of course. Um, I'd just like to say a few things. I believe Vice Mayor Robertson needs to resign uh, immediately. There's a clear conflict of interest at play with him and his brother, the sheriff. Oh. I believe the obvious misuse of funds for the added security at council meetings was ethically no different from embezzlement. And it has been justified with blanket racism. Additionally, I believe the mayor's desire to play his way out of it, or their way out of it, shows no moral character. I think it shows that she believes you can buy your way out of wrongdoing, which is a disgusting sentiment. As to some other important issues in our community, I ask that you please take seriously the concerns raised by the Stanton Equity Coalition, as well as their advice on how to properly further address racial gas in our schools. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, also, I said, uh, what a little clip for you from here. I think the expansion of the jail is a huge mistake, and any understanding of psychology or sociology will make that apparent. I would like to see further funding for other resources, such as the BCFC, or other things you might have around that would actually address underlying issues in our community. Things such as mental health that substantially exacerbate drug addiction. That's about all I got for you. Thank you for your time. Great, right, thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 6-9 on the line? <laughs> Hello? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. My name is Barbara Lee and I live at 904 Rockway Street, Stanford, Virginia, 24401. I'm calling tonight to congratulate uh, Attorney Gwen and I wish him very much luck and success. I'm sorry to wait uh, this new council has treated you, but I'm sure you will be successful. Now, the other thing that I want to address is Ms. Darby and Ms. Oates. Now, Ms. Oates, I read your statement in the newspaper, and I will not have a further discussion with you because it just seems like you don't quite get it. But your statement about Dr. King was a little over the top. You don't understand, quite understand what a ride is. But that ride on January the 6th was nothing like any ride you've ever seen in this country. But if you and Miss Darby and your squad can sit there on council with good conscience, then so be it. But we will make sure that you all will be a one-term council. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in seven zero on the line? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Nancy Charles. I live in Greenville. Um, I just wanted to speak real briefly. I believe that this is the last meeting for your retiring city attorney, Doug Gwynn. So I'm calling in order to thank Doug for his service to the citizens of our area. He has personified professionalism with a soul, always using his sharp mind and thorough understanding of the law to be a champion for the people. During the long, six long years of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline campaign, he worked tirelessly 
to protect the rights of the citizens of Stanton, especially with respect to the serious threats to the city's water supply that were created by the proposed pipeline. He was able to help Stanton's leaders navigate this threat through multiple channels and agencies from the local level to the state and federal levels. When that battle went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, he was there. The end of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was certainly a result of death by a thousand cuts, and Doug Gwynn was able to help organize and deliver several of those cuts. The ACP is not the only reason I'm calling in to praise Mr. Gwynn, because he does not like to call attention to himself. You might not realize what a force he is in giving voice to those who are not often heard. The African-American community, women, students, to name just a few. He recognizes the importance of remembering our history, and that means the history of all our community members many of whom have not been included in our traditional histories of the past. So I just wanted to call in and thank Mr. Gwynn for a job well done. I know that he will continue to be a force for professionalism and good in our community, even if he is not sitting in the city attorney's chair. Thanks, Doug. It has been a pleasure working with you and getting to know you. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the car Sixteen North Washington Street in Stanton. Good evening, members of council. I would like to thank Doug Gwynn for his professional work with the city of Stanton and specifically his work with the Historic Preservation Commission. Doug's guidance with projects such as the Sears Hill Bridge ensured an excellent outcome for the entire community. Doug provided the, comm the commission excellent professional advice and helped all of us involved with historic preservation learn and better understand application of the zoning code and its relevance with court cases and the Virginia code. Thank you, Doug. Take care. Thank you. Next caller. Hi, this is Mitch Narduzzi at 130 South Jefferson Street, and I hadn't planned to call in tonight, but decided that uh, I needed to express the fact that I am uh, standing in solidarity with Stanton Equity Coalition and demanding that City Council um, actually listen to the voices of the unheard and then follow through with your promise to actually um, produce some tangible results. Um, I'm also calling in about the expansion of the Middle River, River Regional Jail. I know that you all know where I stand on this issue. Um, a jail expansion is not the answer, just as the investment is. And I will be sending you all a link to the webinar that we held on that just this week so that you can get the information from experts across the fields, advocates, and justice-involved members of our population and their families instead of wasting my time going over that here. But all of the things that Hannah Whitmer um, proposed earlier are true about our criminal justice system. Our systems need to be reformed. Our jails do not need to be expanded. And I implore you to vote no new dead. Instead, we need to be um, reinvesting that money in community-based services that actually promote public safety while providing services for the population that we're supposed to be taking care of. I also want to address the issue of the golf carts that you were talking about earlier um, in your work session. I would also um, ask that that committee go back to the drawing table instead of coming up with the one answer that they were seeking in the very beginning, that they actually explore creative solutions that include something that would benefit all of our citizens at a uh, lesser cost. I wanted to also speak to the fact that the mayor has not um, taken proper action for reconciliation and has not held herself accountable for the statements that she made at the last city council meeting when there has been a huge community outcry for her to seek a better alternative than the behaviors that she continues to demonstrate that causes great harm to our community. Taking one class in equity is not acceptable excuse for continued behaviors of harm. And lastly, I wanna to speak to the Vice Mayor Robertson, I know he loves it when I do that, and Steve Claffey. The fact that you have had, um, will have had a month to figure out how to have a meeting 
to make a decision about allowing council member Mead to provide oversight of what you're doing in the nominations committee is absolutely ridiculous. We have kids across the city as young as five years old that have learned how to master uh, meeting virtual meeting platforms for, for almost a year now. The fact that you can't get it together to do that, to provide that information to another council member out of courtesy is absolutely a disgusting display, again, of your white male privilege and misogyny. And Ms. Hodges, please refrain from calling names to the council members. You may continue. All right, next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 29 on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Uh, this is Walt Obenchain of 800 Opie Street here in Stanton. Uh, I'm here this evening to speak on behalf of Doug Gwynn, whom I understand is attending his last city council meeting in his position of city attorney. I first met Doug back in 1992 when I was appointed to serve on the Stanton City School Board. It was immediately obvious that he was a man of strong convictions and very accomplished and confident in his role. Never, and I mean never, did he offer advice that would have placed the board in any legal jeopardy. Over the next 10 years, I came to rely on him to keep us on the straight and narrow, and we were never disappointed. Doug was always fair and honest in his dealings, regardless of the situation. He would offer different legal scenarios when confronted with a problem, and then totally step back, allowing the board to make their own best decision. At that time, he represented several other school divisions in the Valley, all of whom were completely satisfied with his services. Later on, he and I became reacquainted when I became city council member in Stanton. Once more, his character and integrity were always on full display, but in a quiet and admirable manner. His best legal advice would be explained and offered, giving free reign then to council to be totally responsible for any decision rendered. If he was ever disappointed, he kept those feelings to himself, even if pressed. I'm pleased to hear he will continue on with his school board duties. They will continue to reap the benefit of a legal scholar and a true gentleman. If the next city attorney works as tirelessly, then you will have been very successful in your search. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Walt. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 58 on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, good evening, members of Stanton City Council. My name is Julie Schofield, and I live at 220 Lake Avenue here in Stanton. Um, I wanted to speak on two issues this evening. Uh, first of all, I feel very strongly that the Stanton City Council must issue a statement strongly condemning the organizations, individuals, an event of January 6th in our nation's capital and the assault on the U.S. Capitol and members of Congress. I really feel it's important that I hear from my local elected officials that you do not condone these attempts to undermine our democracy through violence. I think, unfortunately, that the statements made by the mayor have really heightened my concern and done nothing to allay these concerns. I think time is really of the essence that the Stanton City Council make it clear that they condemn white supremacy and fascism and those who support the false claims that the election was stolen. There's not a shred of evidence that this is true, and I need to, to know that my local elected leaders do not believe the kind of misinformation that's being spread to the contrary, and I hope you'll take this up as soon as possible. Secondly, I wanted to speak on the jail expansion. I do not support the expansion of the jail, um, and I hope that, uh, that the city of Stanton will vote no and uh, reject this proposal. I think it's well past time that we make some serious investments in mental health services and in substance use treatment, and we know that these services are not as available as they should be. I also think that we need to further explore alternatives to incarceration, incarceration before we entertain this kind of massive expansion project. 
Um, it is not a good use of taxpayer resources. I think we should turn our attention to criminal justice reform, and I urge the council to oppose the MRRJ expansion proposal. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in six zero on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and express your comments. My name is Pamela Mason Wagner. I live at 164 North Coulter Street. I had not planned to speak this evening, but decided to do so when I heard that the vote on expanding the jail could come as early as next Tuesday. Everyone in the Middle River Jail is somebody's son or somebody's daughter, and over 70% are somebody's father or mother. The impact of incarceration is dire on families. Serving even one or two days can get somebody fired, creating financial distress for the incarcerated and their families. Jail is traumatic even when it's not overcrowded. I also attended the webinar hosted by Council Member Mead. According to a presentation given by the local public defender's office, I learned that roughly one third of the detainees at Middle River Jail are awaiting trial, meaning they have not yet been found guilty. In our country, we are presumed innocent until proven guilty. So I would implore you to explore alternatives for pre-trial detainees before voting for a jail expansion. I also learned that substance abuse and mental health are both drivers of incarceration, and that that fact is widely acknowledged by Sheriff Smith and Commonwealth's attorney, Tim Martin. I would ask the council to consider funding and resources to support people with mental health and substance abuse problems before they enter the criminal justice system. Listening to testimonies from family members of people detained at Middle River Jail, I heard stories about detainees being denied access to prescribed medication, denied access to clergy, denied access to jail property, improper use of solitary confinement, and worse. I asked the council not to vote yes, as that would simply enlarge what appears to be a broken system. In the same presentation, I learned of the troubling racial disparities in our jail. And I would implore council to demand answers to these disparities prior to holding a vote. I also learned that perhaps 50% of the detainees are incarcerated for probation violations, which is a large driver of the overcrowding at our jail. And I would urge council to explore alternatives to probation before you vote for expansion. My biggest concern listening to the earlier presentation was the inability of the presenter to answer the question as to why the jail numbers are rising. And it seems to me hiring an architectural firm who stand to benefit financially from a contract for the jail expansion, asking them to conduct research about why additional beds are needed is kind of like asking the fox to keep track of the chickens in the hen house. My biggest question for you tonight is where are the justice impacted people in this conversation? Where are the voices of the formerly incarcerated? You need community input from people interested in diversion tactics and alternatives to incarceration. Surely uncovering ways to reduce the jail population is a more affordable and humane solution to jail overcrowding than building costly new jail cells. So I'm really imploring the council to think long and hard before you take this vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 49 on the line? Yes. Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Jasmine Brooks. I live at uh, 937. Uh, Jasmine, hold on. A I think we're. That's, that's the phone call. Oh, okay. is that? Oh, okay. It was for me. Okay. I live at 930 Sudbury Street in Stanton, Virginia, 24401. As a member of both the Stanton Equity Coalition and the Stanton branch of the NAACP, my disgust with the performance displayed in last city council meeting from council members Claffey, Darby, Robertson, and Mayor Oates echoes the sentiment shared in our last letter and our letters to city council as well as the press release shared two days ago. I am further perturbed by the request that I be polite 
in response to your racism and especially in the face of bi-weekly smugness from your own colleagues sitting next to you. Last week's justification for defense and maintenance of white supremacist violence was all but polite. Tonight's attempt to silence the calling out of white male patriarchy was all but polite. We do not owe you polite. We do not owe you at all. So while I acknowledge the training sessions you mentioned tonight, there was no response to the Stanton Equity Coalition's January 18th letter demanding that our city be made a partner in the GARE program. And I still have not heard a commitment to hiring an equity officer to address the racial disparities that have been demonstrated through data presented by our organization in August. I do not hear a response to the NAACP's demand that a commitment be made to drafting policies, ordinances, and budget distributions that are aligned with the inclusivity pledge that is listed on the city council website. Apart from the request that we be polite, the response was a phone call from a mayor not upset with injustice, not apologetic for harms caused and perpetuated, but a feeble attempt at appealing to some semblance of relationship that has been quid pro quo at best, but at worst manipulative and exploitative. To be clear, Mayor Oaks being a dues paying member of the NAACP does not make you an active member. In fact, though your first payment was made in February of 2008, you have not even maintained those annual dues up to this point. Not true. Even if you had, you cannot pay your way out of racism unless you intend to pay reparations to the black community upon whose backs you've attempted to build your platform and you are out of order for interrupting me. Social safety nets, a quality education, adequate housing and opportunities for employment with pay on par with white counterparts, closing the gaps in policing and incarceration that disproportionately impacts our community as opposed to expanding local jails is the only way that you can pay your way out of systemic racism and interpersonal race racism. I could go on, but the point is that you have not paid your way out because you paid annual dues to the NAACP. You have not paid your way out of accountability for harmful rhetoric. And you have not paid your way into our silence or politeness. We do not owe you. Before another response to the Stanton Equity Coalition or to the NAACP is released, I implore you to consider the words written in the letter and press release that are both sitting in your email inbox and commit to doing the work necessary to alter the material reality of the communities you have been elected to serve. And because it is in my nature to be polite. To Council Member Brenda Mead, I say thank you for your continued efforts to push for transparency in the work, community partnership, and policies that reflect the equity too many folk are talking about, but not actualizing. Thank you for, for listening, and to all of you, do have a good night. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Next caller. Are there any other callers? There are no further callers, Madam Mayor. Okay, with that, I will um, now ask if you would like to speak uh, from the audience. Feel free to come up to the podium. You have five minutes. Um, again, if you can state your name and your address. The podium is now open. Hi, my name is Megan Kramer. I'm also here from Stanton Equity Coalition. Firstly, I want to echo what Jasmine said, that I do not think our local representatives have the right to ask us not to be upset with them. Um, a lot of people were really upset about the recent comments made. And as public representatives, you are accountable to that upset. And that is your job to hear that upset. And it might be at one of you specifically, but that is part of being a representative. I am here again with Stand Equity Coalition, making public our request to hire a full-time equity officer for the city. We were here in August and we presented you with city equity gaps in housing, hiring, arrests, and school test scores and suspensions. We met with the mayor and the city manager again in November, three months later after not hearing back. We asked on our second meeting for a commitment to hiring a full-time qualified equity officer for the city to work on these issues. We told the mayor about the Government Alliance on Racial Equity, a national network of cities with equity offices. While the introductory seminars to learn about here are a good first step. I want to state to the rest of council that we expect a full-time hire, and that is our direct request, to be completely clear on it. We expect this work to happen quickly, and we are asking for substantial change. We do not want symbolic action. We will not be impressed by the bare minimum in the face of injustice. It has been pointed out in this very meeting by another caller that inequity also exists in our jails, which we are considering expanding. For the record, Stan Equity opposes this expansion, but an equity officer is crucial precisely because we are considering policies such as this that could worsen inequity and mass incarceration in our community. 
I also want to point out at the outset of this consideration process that if we can consider such a large budget proposal for things like jail expansion and golf carts, there is no excuse um, for saying that we can't budget for a single hire. As members of local government, I believe that equity for the citizens you serve should be one of your top priorities. I'm publicly stating this mission because our community deserves to gain this commitment publicly from you as soon as possible. A full-time equity officer should be a part of the coming budget, but you can make the promise to work towards this specific goal now. Recent comments by council members on the Capitol insurrection comparing the riots to the movement for Black Lives and quoting Dr. King were disappointing, ignorant, and upsetting. And that is the reason for my tone today, why it has changed from previous requests, because it was upsetting and it is all right for citizens to be upset with you. We sent a letter to council about these comments and how they underscore our need for a professional in diversity and equity working for the city now. Council member Mead began the meeting by reading Dr. King's quote in full, which I was going to do as well. Since she already has read it, here's another. He who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. That goes for the capital insurrection and that goes for inequity in our city now. The US system of white supremacy and inequity that exists in our city as it does everywhere in America is evil. Do not be passive, but move quickly with the understanding that the citizens of Stan are paying attention to your actions and we will continue coming back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. I'm glad you can hear me through two masks. It's possible to speak this way. Deborah Kushner, I live at 1311 North Augusta Street in Stanton. I love City Council's vision statement, responsive, efficient government. But is it? This week I watched Waynesboro City Council meeting live on YouTube with all the councilors using Zoom. One council member couldn't be seen, but nonetheless, the meeting proceeded smoothly with lots of questions and answers back and forth and exhibits that were displayed full screen for the viewing public. Protecting one another from proximity, which we have been warned against by myriad public health officials is a vital way of stopping the spread. Anything less is a dereliction of duties to one another. Forcing city council members to attend in person is both ridiculous and dangerous. Putting restraints on how much a city council member should be shown on a Zoom video is laughable at best, but also it's an invasion of privacy. It's not lost on me that the major push to meet in person comes from the one city council member in the health profession with do no harm as its creed. Responsive and efficient equals adopting Waynesboro's model. Council must bend with the times and with the pandemic. Yes, golf carts need replacing, but all at once? Not a fiscally responsible idea, even if the city was flush with revenue. But without even a small survey of usage and demographics, other forms of funding should be thoroughly researched first. That would be efficient. The biggest ticket item on the agenda is the jail expansion. I hope you all watch the webinar with the link I emailed you later this week. If you haven't, Reserve your opinion until you've seen it. There is a wealth of raw, hard-earned experience to draw on there from the formerly incarcerated and family and friends firsthand accounts of what it's like inside that jail. I was shocked by the accounts of negligence, abuse, inattention, and inability to consider the incarcerated people as humans. Increasing the size of this institution will only ensure that these horrors continue. Alternatives to jail, diversion programs, real treatment for alcohol and substance abuse issues, intensive mental health treatment availability, ending the cash bail, clear people's tax, are all investment in people's safety and lives. The prison industry is run, run like a warehouse. Indeed, it is warehousing humans. Thinking, feeling, humans with children, parents, livelihoods, hobbies, loves, hopes, and dreams. The highest percentage of deaths in jail is due to suicide. Reflect on that a moment. It really haunts me and it should haunt you. 
Fully 50% of incarcerated people in the jail are there for reasons unrelated to their alleged crime, such as misprivation hearings, inability to make bail, positive drug tests, etc. These people are being punished for not having the income, contacts, or mental acuity to circumvent the system that most of us could. Innocent until proven guilty? Apparently not. You've heard from architects, builders, and jail supervisors whose business it is to incarcerate people. You haven't listened to the people most directly affected. Locking people up, just locking up poor people destroys lives and thus communities. This antiquated, inhumane system can change, and you have before you an efficient and responsive vehicle for that change. The Stanton Equity Coalition's proposal to hire an equity offer is an investment in our community that will have real and lasting impact on the lives of individuals who have felt the devastating effects of our, quote, separate but equal, unquote, unequal systems. The coalition has clearly shown you the facts that demonstrate that there's a white Stanton and a black Stanton, and they are anything but equal. The quote, urban renewal raising of Stanton's African-American neighborhood was just one such horrid scar on the city's history. The oppression continues as the data most clearly shows. Stanton needs to commit to, at the very least, this very workable project that would positively affect the welfare for present and future school children, our present and future neighbors, and give more equal footing to all for all that will directly Thank affect you, Ms. Kishore, prison your population size. You. But there's no one else, and I've got one Thank more you. paragraph. Do you see the connection between racial breakdowns in the jail population and the Mr. racial Mr. breakdown I'm going to ask you to stop. I need to be data. fair to everyone, so please. On the last one. So, please. It's like please. two more so, questions. No, no, please. The Thank equity you. gap no, data Ms. starts Kushner. in the schools. Ms. Kushner, I'm going to have to ask you to stop. Ms. Kushner, please stop. Without Ms. Kushner, I'm going to have to ask you to stop. This is more than the finish of the It's a natural line to lack of equity in right. home ownership, um, the city office governor, office? hiring, Ms. Kushner, can you please, can you please? Okay. Take two minutes. Oh, one paragraph. Ms. Kushner, it was more than one sentence. I'm sorry, but I have to be fair. Okay, next speaker. Actually, there are a few more, so please. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Cindy Connors. I live at 106A Skyline Avenue. And over the last couple of weeks, uh, oh, by the way, I have written to city council about no on the jail expansion and, and some other things, but I wanted to come here to talk about the thing I was most passionate, emotional about. Um, I've been thinking about the time I took my 12 year old daughter and my 78 year old parents uh, to DC for the first time. We traveled from Colorado and I had been invited by a congressman who, by the way, was not in the same political party as me. And uh, it's just relevant to the fact that when we went there, we were amazed by the professionalism, the politeness, the welcoming, and the fact that once, you know, once the metal detector can wander around um, and go to anyone's office, just, you can even just bop in and drop off a business card or a letter or talk to people. And my, you know, my daughter said to me, wow, mom, like, how come we can just walk around here? You know, she was, this is a big deal place. And, you know, the, she was told by uh, me and the folks we were talking to and congressmen that, uh, well, this is the people's house. And when I watched those events on January 6th, uh, I also have many friends who work there, both sides of the aisle. And uh, January 6th, I was heartbroken by what I watched. And if we go by the, the, we defend those actions, you know, they, heck, they could come here if someone disagreed with all of you. Um, I don't, we need to stop the violence, period. And mm -hmm. I want to know from this city council, this wonderful place I moved to a couple years ago because of its friendliness, mm -hmm. its kindness, its open city council meetings. I want my city council members to literally denounce what happened on January 6th and the violence because if we continue those kind of behaviors, our democracy will severely suffer. And my now granddaughter will think that place isn't safe. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Brady Johnson. Um, I have lived in Stanton at 905 West Johnson Street for three and a half years now. Um, I am a mother of a four-year-old who will be attending Stanton City Schools next year. Um, I am a lover of our small yet progressive town. I stress progressive as it has been a breath of fresh air to live in a small town in the, in the South and still be proud of forward-thinking policies in our community. And that is why I stand before you. You as our leadership stand at a crossroads to listen to the inspirational teachings of your constituency and progress as a community or continue to be stagnant and as the world moves forward around you, therefore regressive. As a Stantonian and a mother as, and as a progressive, I implore you to move forward in the hiring of an equity officer, becoming a member of the GARE program, vehemently opposing the expansion of the jail and simplest of all, not inciting the words of Dr. King in defense of insurrectionists, domestic terrorists and white supremacists. Thank you. And also as a hard of hearing individual, um, it would be really nice if you all would hire a sign language interpreter. Um, just something that I've noticed tonight as um, Stanton has a very big deaf community. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Any other speakers? Welcome. Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, I'm Charles Ann Bishop Jr., 38 Woodley Road. Um, sitting back here, I <laughs> realize what a dinosaur I am. I've been uh, appearing before this council in some form or another for almost 50 years. Uh, some council people I've known since before they were born. Uh, I consider, I, I'm not acquainted with the vice mayor, but I consider the other four of you and Carolyn Dole my friends. Uh, sometimes we disagree. Right now, we're disagreeing on a whole lot of stuff, but that's not my purpose tonight. My purpose is to come down and I, I'm demonstrating I don't have confidence in my technical ability to hook up with the, with the phone call. But I wanna reiterate some of the co earlier comments of my good friends, uh, Jim Harrington and Walt and Nancy and Barbara, I'm here to thank Doug Wheel. I've known Doug's family for 50 plus years. I had the privilege of working with his parents. They were outstanding people. Uh, my father-in-law had a saying, he didn't lick that off the grass. Well, Doug Gwynn didn't make his quality and his professionalism off the grass. He came by naturally. And I want to say that what's obvious to a lot of people, Doug Gwynn is one of the great legal minds, not just in this area, in the Commonwealth. He's known as that. And as a friend, I know how much sincerity and effort he's put into this job. And I hope we're not in a situation where we don't wish, miss the water till the well runs dry. I wish Doug the best. And just as a citizen, I wanna thank him. And as a friend, I wanna thank him. And as I say, sometimes that's a thankless job. Yours is a thankless job. You can't please all the people all the time. And even when, as I say, when we disagree, my hat's off to you for being willing to serve. And my whole purpose tonight, and if I had, like I say, confidence in my technical ability, I wouldn't be out in this cold at the ripe old age I am. <laughs> but I don't regret it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you. Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. All right, any other speakers? Yvonne Wilson to 17 First Street. I did have something written tonight, but I have made some amendments to it. But I would like to begin that I would like to tell you a story about a little girl growing up during the civil rights era 
The town in which she grew up was about to desegregate the public schools. Her father, who was the mayor, had a huge hand in implementing this momentous change. But hatred, racism, and strife were thick in the air, and this little girl witnessed the worst humanity had to offer. Due to her father's efforts in desegregation, his family had paid a price. People spat on them every time they went out. They were called end lovers and publicly ridiculed and harassed. A kidnapping attempt was made on this little girl's nine-year-old brother. The Klan attempted to burn a cross in their yard. On the day that this little girl's father was supposed to walk the first black student into one of the public schools, a brick was thrown through their living room window. The harassment got so intense, so invasive, so dangerous, that the little girl and her mother had to have a police escort every time they went to the grocery store. But recognizing that this fight was more important than their safety, the little girl's mother said to her father, you take care of the city, I'll take care of the children. All of this and more happened just because her father stood for the right of all citizens, no matter the color or race, to receive an education. The father who stood against racial injustice was Ronald Williams. The three-year-old little girl is Andrea Oakes. The town, Danville, Virginia. The reason why Mayor Oakes used the words of Martin Luther King Jr. was not to commandeer nor usurp his significance in civil rights. She used these words because the very tense political and social climate we have right now is fomented by anger, frustration, and deafness. We don't listen, we scream. We don't defend, we accuse and judge. We go to church and our spiritual circles preaching and praising tolerance, yet we come out of them praising and preaching intolerance. Mayor Oakes' use of that quote was to plead one thing and one thing only, to listen. Listen to the aggrieved, the frustrated, the disenfranchised. It's not in support of a riot. It's a plea to understand why these riots happen. And those who have the power and authority must take a step back and listen. We don't want what happened on the Capitol, Portland, and Seattle to happen here. We must work better to build better. And throwing out baseless accusations of racism is not building a bridge. I have seen the worst that humanity has offered. All I've heard was vitriol and anger. And no one has sat back to even understand the spirit of what's really going on in this country. I don't know what you all's belief system is. I don't know if you go to church. I don't know if you believe in God. I don't know any of that. But what I do know is that the same anger that was displayed at the BLM riots was the same anger that was displayed at the Capitol. All of you are calling on the council to denounce what happened at the council at, at the Capitol. And I understand that. I denounce that too. But not one of you have denounced what BLM and Hatifa have done for the past year. On top of that, I just want to make a confession. I was there on January the 6th. I was there on the other side of the mall. A lot of us, thousands of us, felt like we weren't heard. Because the moment we say we are Trump supporters, the moment we're saying, when we say that we don't agree with you, now all of a sudden, we're domestic terrorists. We need to be silenced. What happened on the Capitol is unacceptable. But what is also unacceptable is giving a pass to another group of people that did the same thing and even worse. Ms. Wilson, I'm sorry, your time is up. I do apologize. All right. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? All right. 
with that, the portion of the meeting for public comment is now closed. And I will entertain a motion to go into a closed meeting. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move that cancel enter a closed meeting for discussion of specific prospective candidates for employment or appointment as possible interim city attorney and discussion of the salary and compensation of a specific appointee of council pursuant to Virginia code section 2.2-3711A1. All right, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a second by council member Holmes. The motion was made by Vice Mayor Robertson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We're now in closed session. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to go back into open session. Mayor Oates. Um, Councilman Claffey. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's been a long night. <laughs> Councilman Holmes. I move the council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawful exempt public business matters were discussed and only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I'd like to second that. All right, that's Councilman Claffey. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. No. You don't want to go into open? Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Dahl. Ms. Dahl. No. This is this coming out of closed meeting. This is going into open meeting. Going into open. I, I am aware of that. Okay. Oh, okay. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion concerning the interim city attorney. Uh, Mayor Oaks. Councilman Holmes. I move to appoint Andrew McRoberts as the interim city attorney for the city of Stanton, city council from February 1st, uh, 21 to uh, March 14th, 21. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Excuse right. me, Madam Mayor. Point, point of um, clarification. clarification. Um, yes. I think so. I, if I recall correctly, the agenda briefing has a slightly different motion than the one made by Councilman Holmes, which we didn't see that one. Uh, okay, hold provides on. Provides for the possible extension <coughs> of the engagement beyond the March 14th date if the if the new city attorney uh, believes it appropriate for the continuation of a matter that the interim is already working on. All right, thank you for the point of clarification. Um, Mr. Holmes, do you it, mind yeah. revising your motion? I move that one city council hereby appoint the following individual of Andrew McRoberts as the interim city attorney of the city of Stanton for the period commencing February 1st, 2021 and can you, continuing through March 14th, 2021 and that the mayor be authorized to execute an engagement letter setting forth the terms on which legal services will be provided to the city and two, the permanent city attorney be authorized to extend engagement of the interim city attorney beyond March 14, 2021 on any matter pending as of that date consistent with the city attorney's authorization under the city code to have the management charged and controlled of all law businesses in, of the city. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffey. I will second that. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. No. 
Vice Mayor Robertson. No. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna ask the city manager for point of clarification. Um, the other issue concerning the um, existing city attorney does not require a vote, correct? Uh, I'm afraid, um, Mayor Oaks, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not privy to the uh, substance of the matter that council has been discussing. How, how about if, if I was to tell you that Jonathan Venn is, is aware of the final settlement for our city attorney who is now retired? I appreciate that. Um, I, I, um, it's an agreement um, by the council, so we are in a, um, so an agreement. So I, I think, um, why don't, um, uh, perhaps a member of council would like to make a motion. So I'm gonna say something here, and one of you um, perhaps, um, and, and um, you know, can, can adopt this, this language as your own if, if it feels appropriate uh, by perhaps by just saying so moved. Um, do I understand correctly that Mr. Venn has provided a memorandum? For final settlement. Okay, so, um, and do any of you, um, No, go ahead. No, no, it's no Steve. Um, Councilman Claffey, um, it's fine. I would just want you to um, be prepared to make the motion if you if you so desire. That's fine. We don't need this. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, sit down. <laughs> a, me a member Please. of council might choose to make a motion approving to the extent required the proposed final settlement final payments to the city attorney as detailed in a memorandum was the memorandum provided by the city attorney it's provided by the city personnel manager the hr it's director it's a memorandum from mr venn to you yes yes as detailed in a, in, in a memorandum from John Venn, uh, Chief Human Resources Officer to City Council. This is Carolyn Dahl, the, the, memo, the memorandum was from the city attorney, not John Venn. Well, yeah, Mr. Venn is the one that broke down the- Final settlement Yeah, the final payment. settlement payment. So uh, there was a letter by Mr. Gwynn asking for certain what, things. So was it a, a letter or a memorandum? It was, it was a letter. So the, the motion could be to approve a final payment to the city attorney as requested by him in a letter to council and as further detailed by John Venn, the city's chief human resources officer to council. Yes. So move. Okay. Right, so we have a, a motion on the floor by Councilman Claffey, <laughs> second by Council Member Darby. Any further discussion? I'm hearing none. Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mr. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Me. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. And with that, as Mayor of the Stanton City Council, I hereby adjourn this meeting.